Mr. Mayor. Okay. I will turn it over to our two registrars who were very nice and pleasant yesterday talking with the governor about a couple things, including absentee ballots and the upcoming election. So That's page, page 17. 17. Okay, I will turn it over to you two. Okay, um, Berea? Yes, I'll start off. We'll just go through top to bottom. You guys know we have a pretty small budget, not much changes. Um, so in the first section for the salaries, lines three and four, the deputies, that represents a 3% increase. They're currently getting paid $18.32 an hour. They're just hourly, no benefits. And um, with the increase, it'd be $18.87 an hour. Um, and then we'll take on some seasonal help as we get closer to the governor election. Um, we have, we've just uh, brought in a new assistant as well. So um, the office is filling up nicely. Uh, as far as Carol and I go with our salaries. So last year we proposed to you the, the $27,000, $27,500 salary, but that never actually went into effect. And nothing that's gone through the budget has gone into effect for the registrar's salary change since the year 2017. Um, so that's why you see um, the 30,000 in there for this coming budget year. Um, we'd be really grateful if that was approved. Um, interestingly, the ROVAC, which um, is the Registrar of Voters of Connecticut Association, recently done, did a salary survey. And when you boil down all the numbers for towns the same size as ours, most of those registrars are making between um, 25 to $35,000 a year. For part-time work. Um, Maria, so where are you at right now? Excuse me? Where are you at? Uh, I'm salary? at home. No, no, no. no. You're, 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 how much are we making? Uh, I believe the actual number is 24,512. And it hasn't increased since uh, the 2017-2018 budget. I, I think okay. I see 27,5. Yeah, that's not actually what we're being paid. That was in our budget last year, but it never went into effect. Huh. Yeah. <coughs> yep. Okay. These guys uh, told me, Mike, just so you guys know that, and I checked with the town attorney. If you guys vote on it and it's in their budget, you do not need to go to another council meeting and do it again and that's been the confusion i think right that's been the confusion so carol and i like we were under the impression that we had to sit in front of like an, a full meeting with townspeople and plead our case and we just you know we just weren't comfortable doing that so the the salary increases haven't gone through yeah um, and just, to, just to um put my two cents in there was one time where we did that one time we got that increase camille and i had to go to a town council meeting in monday on a monday and present in front of everyone and every time our we've had an approval we've gotten the runaround and then it's come down to well you need to go to council after it's been approved in a budget meeting to present again in front of the entire town to get that approved. So that's where- Who said we're that at. to you, Carol? Oh, um, HR, previous managers, um, Mike O'Neill. I mean, we've gotten the runaround for years. And Bonnie, um, you say the case? Pardon? You say that's not the case? Right, after these guys told me, asked me about it, I said, well, I'll just check with the town attorney. And Ken, and Ken said, no, they don't have to. If you approve it in the budget, it's approved, just like you do with the rest of us. That's yeah, easy. I mean, it's kind of small potatoes, but it's big to Carol and I. <laughs> yeah, of course. Well, um, and, and, you know, I think Marie and I also want to say that, you know, we put in a lot of hours, way more than 
our scheduled hours. I, uh, we were working seven days a week, um, many months in the presidential year. You know, we're going to be doing that this year. Um, we had redistricting this year. So we are putting in a lot of hours and we have a very hard time retaining deputies. So we're always short staffed. And, and also, which obviously the burden falls on us. So not only are we short staffed, um, and, and we have a lot more work because, um, you know, because of everything being electronic, cards aren't coming in on occasion. It, it's daily, 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 you know, many cards, many changes happening all the time. It's a, it's a, it's a whole different world in elections. And, you know, after this November, it probably be, will be even a lot more different if this um, goes through with the early voting. And for those of you that really like the numbers, from when our, the last time our salary went up till now, our voter base in the town of Wethersfield has gone up 19%. And that's a direct link to the amount of work that we additionally have now. Got it, okay. So, okay, moving along. Um, and I do have the towns, if you care, Mike, I can tell you which towns are, you know, responded which way to the thing, but. Um, nope, I'm fine. Okay, uh, great. Thank and knowing you. we would be meeting tonight, I talked to your lobbyist at the Capitol today and he gave a pretty good plug for Rovac. Excellent. I appreciate that. Okay. Um, so FICA, there's nothing to talk about there. Nothing to talk about workers comp. Nothing to talk about in copying and binding. As far as travel training and dues, I know um, I had told Bonnie to hit that section when she asked for... Um, money to give up. It's a little tough though, because we're actually required to um, get CPE credits each year. And by going to these conferences, that's how we get a bulk of our CPE credits. Um, so we really need to continue to do that. The dues are in that section, um, as well as registrar training, which is online. Um, and those courses are $200 a course. And I myself have five left to take, and so does Diane. So well, those Diane, are the numbers that are in that section. Um, I, I really don't know what to say. Like the, the cost for the conference is fixed. There's nothing we can do about it. It's a three-day conference twice a year. Um, we just had the one for the spring two weeks ago but that's the number that was affected. Um, so I don't know if you have any questions on that. I'm good, anybody else? Yeah, just briefly. Sure. Does the registrar uh, report directly to the town council or do they report to the town manager? We report to no one, we're elected officials. I report to the citizens. That's right, we're elected. And we work for our um, our parties. Yeah, right. Interesting. Mm -hmm. We're elected. We're on the ballot in the presidential year every four years. And the um, town council sets the salary, then, or does yeah, somebody? Yeah, it would be actually really nice if the secretary of the state set the salary. Yeah, and sure. so that all the registrars were paid the same, since we're all doing the same work bigger towns work more hours um but unfortunately it's not written that way and each town has to vote on it each town votes on your salary no right. well each town votes on how they're going to pay them some some are salary some are hourly um there's tiny little towns in connecticut they work a half day on wednesday every town is different so their needs are different so does our town have like an ordinance that that designates how the salary of the registrars are set then? Or the I charter? don't think it's how it's set. I think we do what we're doing tonight and ask you guys exactly for a salary. That's the way it was done when I was here before. Yeah, that that's so, hasn't changed. That's the way it is. So in Weathersfield, at least, the town council sets the registrar's salary. They approve it. They Just approve they it. They approve everybody else's department. Mm -hmm. Well, we often set we set budgetary numbers for departments that are and are not spent. That doesn't mean that we set the salaries of every person in the town. Ours are set. 
Well, that, but right in here, it looks like we're approving an amount. That's why, I mean, it wouldn't. Well, because that, we're at a, this is a budget meeting. We have to put forth what we're requesting for our salary. Right. So this is the only way for us to get our salary adjusted. I don't know any other that avenue. In the have the register have the in the in previous uh, setting of registrar salary has that been done by a council vote? Yeah. To At least it was when I was here before. To specifically a council vote set or a meeting like this. A meeting like this. That, that's what I'm asking. In the past, has it been a specific council vote to set the registrar salary? Yes. Through the budget. Well, that's different. That's setting a budget. Setting a budget and setting a salary are two oh, different okay. things. Yeah. So I'm asking it, in the past, has it been set? Obviously, maybe it wasn't set through the budget or else their salary would be 27.5. Right. No, but, it was so that's not necessarily the case. But we got a we got the runaround, plain and simple. We went to different people, and different people told us different things. We finally spoke to Bonnie. Bonnie spoke to the lawyer, and it shouldn't have been that way. But you know what? I don't have time to chase down people about my salary. We went through the process. We did what we were supposed to do, and here we are. Um, you know, um, I will get you. Uh, I got to find it. A copy of uh, the town attorney's opinion back to me. Okay, yeah, it'd be interesting. And that's not that's not a discussion about whether or not you should get the 20, maybe you should get the 275 back dated, right? It's just I'm trying to understand the process, not the valuation okay. of the and I get it, But we we were trying to understand the process because depending on who we talked to, we got different answers. And it was always felt like we were, you know, we were confused because nobody ever gave us a straight answer. And then, and then when we finally approached Bonnie, she talked to the lawyer and she, he said, no, it should not be this way. So last year, you know, when you in it, it, the town has a piece of paper that you have to fill out when you increase someone's um, salary, I forget what the name it is, like a PAP or something. Yeah, so I it. filled that out for the deputy last year and was told to fill one out for Carol and I. Well, I started sure. to fill it out and then I was told um, I think it was Cheryl that might have given me the information that said, oh, no, no, your salary can't be approved. You can't, you know, be adjusted that way, that that was not an acceptable way to put through our salary increase. Which is why my first question was, who who does the registrar report to? Because if they report to the town manager, the town manager could approve that. If it's like the town clerk and they report to us, then we would approve it like the town clerk's salary. And then your discussion, the response was that it's the voters, but there's no ordinance or charter provision that provides for that. So we're sort of stuck in this interesting land. Right, so here we are. Sure, all right. Well, I'd love to have, uh, we'll get the report from the town attorney to see you know, how that works. Thanks okay. for the information, I appreciate it. And there was no comment on whether or not you deserve the 27.5 in the past or 30 now or 35, you know, just so we're clear. Okay. okay. Back to All right. optional. So we got some training, dues, um, poll workers. It looks like last year being a off year, we're at 18. I was trying to go back to the presidential year. It's increased to 30,000 because of uh, gubernatorial election. Right. Maria and Carol, does that? Probably Sorry. hired about a hundred people or plus for the presidential year for to work the polls. Mayor, if I may. Sure. Thank you. Does that include the August primary that we are probably going to have both a Democratic and Republican primary? For the the thirty thousand. Yes. I don't know, uh, Maria. Did you look at those numbers? The 30,000 um, does include that, but it looks like it was reduced by $2,000. Oh no, that's the worker salary. So you yes. budgeted for primaries this year because it looks like both yes, parties are gonna have- Yes, it does include it. In the presidential year, I, I don't have it in front of me, but I believe the number was closer to 37,000 in our presidential year. So this is for, um, and that year had a primary. So this is for our- and we, we will have a primary. Yeah, and so primary. the 30,000 is what we're 
Got assuming it. for this year with the primary. Thank you. Yep. Mike, I have one question. Sure. Maria, if we could go back to the last item. Yeah. Am I understanding that the, the uh, conferences, the town manager reduction of $400 doesn't allow you to take all the conferences that you need? Is that what you were saying? That is what I was saying. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's actually um, in Title IX that we have to have those training hours. So it's really not something that we can opt out of. We have to go to those conferences to get our hours of training in. I'm just trying to clarify if, you know, the, if, there's, if, if there are other reductions, if you can just explain that, you know, that doesn't work for you even though it was put in, okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah, that's why I wanted to point it out that we needed those CPE credits. Um, okay. Our budget is, it's just so small. There's just not a lot of extra yeah. in it to begin with. So it's really just our, you know, our bare necessities. <laughs> Some departments there have been town manager reductions that the, the department was okay with. They were, you know, working right. in agreement. So I just want to clarify what, which ones you, you have to have. So yep. thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> okay. Any, down. are we travel training and dues still? Co-worker? No, professional services. Yep. Okay. Um, well, as far, under there we have ballots, which we, you know, I mean, there's no cutting ballots. Um, the coding for the for the um, scanners, election office supplies. I mean, all these are necessities. Um, it says say reduced for food. Um, we don't pay our ele election uh, um, people a lot anyway, and um, there are many towns who pay them much more. Uh, and to get someone to work a sixteen-hour day, which between five a.m. to ten p.m. is basically what they work, it's not a lot of money. And during um, particularly presidential and gubernatorial, we do bring food in because they're, sometimes they are not even able to take a break. So, I mean, you know, um, we don't do dinner during municipal elections. We only do that um, during the, the federal elections. So we, you know, we're not giving stuff away here. I mean, they, they it's amazing that many of them come back year after year for the, um, the small amount of money they receive. And, and as I said, it's, a, it's typically a 15 hour day, plus moderators have to do training every couple of years, which is three to four hours. Plus they are expected to attend a training session prior to the election. And um, all that is kind of figured into what they get for the day. And it's not a lot of money. And then on and uh, to me, you know, if Obviously, if you can't leave for dinner, you should at least be able to grab a bite to eat. It will, we'll send in pizza and stuff like that. So that's what the food is all about. Um, ballots, we already talked about coding of the, the machines um, and any election office supplies. Um, we have professional services also for um, the um, laptops, which I, I'm sure you're all aware of that you can, um, type in a code and see who's voted real time. I think everyone loves that, you know, that service uh, as opposed to what we used to have was unofficial runners, you know, the unofficial poll workers with runners. I mean, I, I don't think there's anyone D side or R side who doesn't love the real time um, data from the polls. Um, and, and, um, you know, and, and, and the convenience of the at, at the polls of them being able to search the whole town if the voters in the wrong place. So it eliminates holding up lines and not being able to find people because it will find anyone in that town within a matter of seconds. So that that's what the uh, um, that's something that we're um, continuing to uh, get services through. Um, and then a lot of them are maintenance services that we are contracted to do. Um, like the AccuVote, they come every year. Um, then obviously our office supplies and general supplies. Um, overall, I think we have a pretty small budget and I, I, we've actually cut, we, we used to pay a lot more for our poll setups. We used to pay thousands of dollars 
to have our polls set set up and broken down, which we don't do anymore. Um, I'm, I just also made a decision. Maria and I made a decision. We are moving District Two to to uh, the key, to the Pickin Center. Um, we traditionally had two polls there until the last redistricting. The last redistricting, we we took a poll out of there. We had District Seven and District Nine at the Pickin Community Center for many many years. Um, we pay fourteen hundred dollars for two. Um, a primary and election at Keeney, and we get complaints about access and how it's hard for people to, they have to go in the back door, they have to take the elevator up. So um, what we are gonna do is go back to that setup at the community center, which is no charge, and have the two poles separated by the divider like we used to do since the redistricting. And those postcards are going out this week. <laughs> Carol, the rental of polling locations, the 1400 times two, is that for um, and general election? Let me the um, the, that for, for the Keeney, it was 1400 times two. For Incarnation and Methodist, which are the only polls we'll be paying for now, that's um, also, that's, Methodist is 400 and Incarnation is 300. So Got it. 700 per event. Yep. Um, we do also so have- a, a, Wait a second. So okay. Incarnation 400, Methodist- Methodist is, is 400 and Incarnation is three. Oh, okay. Three, four. What? Okay. So I come up with 700 on election day, on primary day, and then 700 on election day. Correct. So I right. got 400, but you guys have down here 1400 times yeah, well, two. Because That's because we just made the decision. The budget was already done before the decision to combine the two locations. So take out 1400 for 700, two times two Keeney, got it. Mm -hmm. That makes that now numbers that up. Okay. But Mike, give that back to us somewhere else. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what um, we're trying to figure out. <laughs> Thank you. If it's already in the budget, it's in the budget, right? Well, I mean, because the cuts that we talked about were the conferences and then poll workers. Um, it was reduced by 2000. Okay. Right. Yeah, and also that... food was reduced. But um, as I said, I mean, they're not making a lot. I, and, and I can't even imagine saying, oh, guess what? We're not going to pay you as much going forward. Um, I think they are amazing that they work those long days for the pay that they get now. Got it. I'm not kidding. Mm hmm. Anybody else with any questions? Maria or Carol, anything final? Um, no, not really. Just uh, I think we covered it all. This I'm good. Good. Okay. What do I do? Thank you. This. Get this. Who's talking? Uh, I'm going to mute. Don't worry. Okay. <laughs> All right. So the next department we have is planning and economic development. That's on page 31. Thank okay, you, so Carolyn Maria. Thank you, everyone. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Bye. And uh, I put together the planning side. Joya put together as best she could because she's new economic development side of this budget. So I'm just going to hit on a couple of highlights, and then um, we'll go into the CNEF and the capital improvement. So when you look at the salaries, that's the new configuration that you know you guys approved. So what you see is a, just a completely different. Um, you'll see economic development director, then planner, then clerk one, and a commission clerk. So that's gonna that's the new configuration we have right now. Um, 
At some point, we're going to have to probably, well, obviously next year, we'll split out economic development from planning. So it's going to be two separate departments because both of those people will be reporting to the planner. Uh, not the planner, the town manager. Um, copy and binding. Um, there is a reduction there for the town calendar, reduced by 2,500. Um, I'm not sure that they went as quick as they typically did this year. I know it came out extremely late, so that might be part of it, but in talking with Cheryl, she said you might be able to reduce that. Well, Bonnie, if you look at that line item. Yep. Uh, town calendar, town manager reduced by 2,500. So we go from 5,000 to- 3,500, yep. Is that 1,500 or 2,500? You're reducing. No. Oh, you're right. Yeah, it's 15. That okay. is a mistake. Thanks, Mike. Is there, Mike, if I could? Go right ahead. Is there any way we can find out like how many of these calendars are still floating around at the different places that we send them to? Because yeah, I can we, ask I'm Cheryl. Asking, we, suggest, we suggested reducing this last year and it didn't go over very well. We, we got a lot of pushback, so. Pushback from citizens? No, town, towns and committees, I guess, is the way to put it. Um, I'll have, um, Cheryl knows who she distributed them to, so we'll figure it out. I mean, a couple locations that I've seen, they're, they're just- They're still piled. there. I know, I know that. That's why I said, you know, I just, People don't use calendars like they used to. Okay, I can get you that number. Thank you. Yep. Um, see, travel training and dues went up a little bit. Um, Joya, I know you mentioned about you might wanna have some dollars in there, but she forgot to put something in. So I just told her, go to the manager if there's something that really pops up because he's got um, travel and training money too. So we got to remember though, next year, she's going to have to put something in there. Um, let's see. Uh, Joy, you want to talk about um, professional services? <clears throat> There's an increase um, this year. Uh, the commission has talked about a greater push on social media and improving the website, the Great Elm. Uh, that is a huge tool for redevelopment and economic development, business retention and expansion efforts. Um, that's one of the first places anybody goes when they're looking to come to town is either the town website or our Great Elm or social media to find out what's going on and what's available. So there's been a discussion in the commission and the EDIC to um, add some of our marketing materials on the Great Elm um, and increase our social media presence. We did a collaboration with the high school um, and released three business profile videos and that increased our, our hits on uh, Facebook. And then back in December, we did a we kind of put together a quick effort um, with Jesse Smith to increase uh, his like where in Weathersfield with the onion. And that resulted in over 200% increase in hits on the site. So with Marco Pace, one of our commission members, he looked at the analytics. This is his forte in, in his profession and um, we just think if we put a little more effort into and money into improving the sites, we could really make a hit um, and get the town noticed. Okay. And then do you wanna go into support services, Ms. Joya? Oh, sure. Um, support. We'll just go yeah. there. Sorry. Uh, welcome wagon, we have doubling from 500 to 1,000. Meeting supplies, we got from zero to 1,500, but then breakfast meetings. So I would assume that's a food cost. I mean, is everything going by Zoom now or 
the, yeah, the, the, the breakfast meetings haven't, um, from what I understand, haven't really been happening on either Heritage or um, EDIC. I think in the past they had done some, but we don't have any planned right now. Uh, meeting supplies has gone up because we're back to some in-person meetings. We're trying oh. to do, we're trying to move from Zoom to in-person. So that's where that increase. Got it. Uh, welcome wagon we're going to increase that effort as well we're partnering with the library and uh the early childhood uh group with kim bobbin and we're going to try and do a better effort uh, there was a huge number of new children and families that came into town and uh, with those bags it's a great way to get to families to advertise businesses and then when families come to town and as you know the with the ribbon cuttings that keep coming up, we have a lot of new businesses too. So it, it's something we should reinitiate. Uh, EDIC is behind that. Got it. Okay. Everything else looks. Tourism, we're just reducing by 500. Is that manageable? If you increase money into welcome wagon and um, social media, yeah, um, we didn't really. Uh, the The group doesn't want to reduce it, um, but I think we can take the five hundred this year if we have to. We're starting a new initiative um, with Connecticut Public and NPR, so we'll be on the radio and have numerous um, advertisements from starting May, the week of May 2nd, all the way through to middle October. I think it's the week of October 20th where it ends. And they'll be doing things like advertising bicycles on Main and, and um, all the events we have. And just, well, you'll hear us through, you'll hear about historic Weathersfield and Weathersfield in general um, through ad spots. So that coupled with the rack cards and other stuff we do, we were able to kind of juggle the budget and pay for things across fiscal years uh, to spread the budget a little. So we're gonna work with that reduction if we have to. Okay. Mayor, if I could. Go right ahead. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, so I have two questions, Joya. One is in the budget and one is about something that may need to be budgeted. So first, the one in the budget. The Salute to Business, which I know is in September, I want to say the 21st, it's always a great event. Um, yep. I remember a few years ago that we charged $25 a person and we subsidized it heavily. Do you know, and I think we charge more for the dinner now, but not a lot more. Do you know what we charge? And is it an opportunity to charge a little more? Um, you know, we don't want to overcharge people, but to charge a little more to make a little more revenue and, and reduce the sign. So that's my first question. Okay. Do you know um, what the, the charge is? I don't remember what it was this past year. Do you remember, Denise? Uh, the, the fee was $30. 30 yes. okay. And that, Denise, that included like a full dinner at the river. Is that right? That's correct. And we subsidized the rest. So, you know, that from my point of view, that, that, that's really nice, but we, we may be able to increase that amount a little bit. And the other one is not in the budget, but, but important and maybe needs to be budgeted, maybe... Uh, Denise or Joy or Bonnie, you thought about this. I believe the plan of conservation and development is up either this year or next year. Yeah, that's going to be under capital, Ken. Well, that's under capital. Okay, because I, I think that plan is really important. I know we're required to do it. Um, and there's a lot of good stuff, hopefully more stuff we can implement than last time, maybe 10 years ago, but that uh, that we could use. But if that's uh, in another area, then that's yep, fine. You'll be, yeah, but we'll talk about it in a minute. All good. Thanks, Mayor. Mm -hmm. Anybody else with any questions? All right. So if you go to page 80, there's a couple CNEFs for economic development. Joy, you want to hit on those? Yep. So the first one is uh, 205000 for facade improvement. Um, as you guys are all aware, this is uh, EDIC's most valuable tool. Um, we've put about $1.3 million back into the community through the program. Um, this year, 
so far we've been approached by at least six uh, building or business owners um, to do facade projects. And from our estimates, those totals could be close to $260,000 in loans. Uh, so we are looking to take the 205,000 plus the 50,000 from capital improvement to kind of bridge that gap. We have, uh, I think a little over a hundred thousand in the left in the program right now. So that would, that would leave that hundred thousand really for anything new that might come along that we don't know about yet. Go ahead. Okay. Banners. Yeah. Yep. Okay. And then, uh, also, the group um, would like to install some vertical gateway banners or on the gateway rows, I guess I should say, welcome to Weathersfield. Um, they're looking at with the 20,000, we're looking at 50 to 55 banners. Um, some could be rotated for a season. They're, they're working out the details on them, but that is the, the, the thought process. Uh, so that when you come into town, it's or along the ends of Silas Dean or maybe in the center, we're, we're going to determine where it's best, but it would kind of give a sense of place. Okay. And then if you <clears throat> go towards the bottom, we didn't know whether to put it under economic development or planning, but this is something ADIC had requested through the non-capital ARPA fund. A committee and that was Silas Dean Highway Design Plan. Well, actually, they asked for a lot more on that, but the committee decided, and Pat or Tom, you may want to address this, decided just to give money to plan and not go into actual construction work because of all the federal infrastructure money coming out. No, you hit it, Bonnie. Pardon? Yeah, you hit it. That, that's exactly what it was. <coughs> now would we be working with the state in conjunction with that or oh you're, yeah you were going to have we're going to go through Krog and we're going to go through the state Krog will be great and in, instrumental in getting the state on all of us together plus i can't think of her name the woman who came to speak to us from dot mm -hmm. she said she'd be very helpful she would help us get the right people at the table. So the 50,000 would just be for planning on our own, not, not state involvement. The state involvement would come in with the, potentially with the infrastructure program. Okay. I think the original request was 300, something like that. Yeah, would, it was up there. It's gonna uh, include hopefully construction of just a portion of the Silas team, small, small section. And then if you go to 81 is uh, page 81, you have the facade improvement program, more money there, as well as uh, what you were asking about Ken, and that is the plan of conservation and development. Planet Conservation is line 18 and facade is 26. <laughs> and we, we're required to do the uh, plan of conservation and development. Yep, you are. And did, do we know if we had money? Did, had Peter put that money in in the past? You mean the last few years? Yeah, I thought. But there was money in there for three. I uh, think there was a little bit, and this was, will finish uh, it off. For that, for the um, housing, I forget what you call it, the housing yep. study. And I think there was like 15,000 for Silas Dean Highway update of the, of the plan that exists. Is there I, money? I, thought, I thought that was all approved last yeah. this year's budget. So you'll have all the money to do the work. So do we need that 50,000? Oh yeah, yeah. No, actually it's, woo, 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 woo. is it 50 or? Yeah, it's 50, I'm sorry. I was looking at the wrong it's already, one. Well, that's my recollection that it should already be sitting there. That what? I'm sorry, Tom. That the money was already 
included in last in this current budget. No, that's what I mean. We phased some of it in. I believe you're right. So then we wouldn't need another fifty thousand. I think in total it's two hundred or something like that. Denise, do you know? He's, her audio is reconnecting. Huh? Her audio is reconnecting. There we go. You might want to ask her again. Denise, do you know um, if there was money set aside in a previous year? She keeps disappearing. Yeah, she keeps dropping. Could be a connection problem. I don't know. You know what? I'll mark it down just to be sure. And then when Mike gets here, he may know right off the end. Because she keeps bouncing in and out. Hey, when you get a chance, uh, if you could call on me. Go right ahead. Yeah, I don't have to call on anybody. Just I didn't want to cut it. I'm not looking. Oh, All is right. it? All right. Yeah, That's it, I think. For planning and economic development. Matt had a question. Oh, I'm sorry. That's it. Go ahead. Great to see you in the position, by the way. I'm so thrilled that you're taking it out full time and it's very exciting. Um, a couple items. It looks like there's a facade improvement on 26 on page 81, and then there's the 205 as part of the ARPA request on page 80. So is the total concept of 255,000 then? That's correct. So oh, plus Current balance. There's a hundred and ten, I believe. One eighteen currently. Plus the current balance. So okay. So and so then there may be we're talking three one eighteen two fifty five three seventy three seventy ish um, that we look for as far as possible funding in in the facade improvement program for the next go around. So my my question to you is a little bit about return on investment, and I don't necessarily mean in the strict business sense, but real, but in a municipal sense. And that is if we've got, we're talking about $370,000. And we talk about that's for facade improvements. So that's improving the look of the buildings. And we've seen some success in, in, in doing just that, improving the look of the buildings. But the other side of the funding might be to give you a pot of money. A good 370000 is a good start, but um, is not really a lot of money for actually redeveloping. So increasing the value of property. So we increase our tax revenue. And um, way, admittedly weighing, and I'm interested in your opinion, is, if we fund, is, is funding a pot of money that actually does redevelopment, increasing the value of taxable property versus just improving the property so they look better, which may, which may improve the value, but not, uh, maybe not as much, would it, might it be better for us or different, or would it be better for us to then actually fund a redevelopment fund so we're improving the value of properties, which builds and improves the look of properties in addition to the return on investment. And we're talking about 370, so that's starting to get to like, not just a $25,000 for a facade fund, you know? And, and maybe parlaying actually some of that facade money into actual redevelopment money that you can use as a tool to build new instead of paint and, you know, and do some other things that are more than paint, of course. But could you provide some perspective on that? Yeah, well, I'd love both. <laughs> Sure. I think we need it. Uh, I think there's a lot. We're, we're pulling together the redevelopment commission again. Um, it had started up in 2019 and kind of took a back seat during the whole COVID time. Um, but we're now targeting properties, property owners, buildings that have been sitting. Um, and we're really going to do a concerted effort to go out and, and figure out how we can get people in town, whether it's filling the space through a new lease and helping them fill their space or turn the property over. Um, so yeah, anything, I think we are gonna need money in redevelopment. I, I don't, at this moment, I don't have a plan on how to use it though. Um, so I can't sit here and say, you know, aside from the marketing and the social media, like getting our face out there where everyone else is. Um, I was at a meeting yesterday, Advanced CT puts on a partner meeting uh, monthly or so. And the biggest thing they said is with any redevelopment or if you want to get money, if you want to get people in town, the community must show skin in the game. 
And so that's what we have to figure out. How are we going to show how we're committed to the redevelopment and the growth in the community? Um, I know a lot of people are talking about economic development and I heard it in the budget and some of them think, you know, we should build more homes and Keisha farms and things like that. All great ideas to increase the tax base. My professional opinion is shift it from the residents. Let's push the money into business and grow the grand list there. Because with that comes the property the personal property in the business, it comes with everything. It comes with jobs, it comes with bringing people to town. So so if I were as a return on investment for tax revenue though, changing facade, is, is it more important for us to change facades or to actually redevelop by meaning making denser and more, you know, more it, aggregate it, space and more value, more property it, value? It's both. I mean, if if you're going to come into town and you're going to build new and it's going to look great, you know, like the Borden did, which is beautiful, but then all the buildings around you look aged and you might not put that investment there. Uh, so it, it's a combination. We've done a lot with the facade program and some of the projects that are coming before us, um, you know, the Rite Aid building, the um, Atlas Tile building. Uh, these are all people who've approached us to to do a beautiful facade. That'll just spur further development, further upgrades in their areas of Silas Dean or Berlin Turnpike. So it's I can't I can't put weight I can't put more weight on one than the other. I think a brand new construction obviously is going to grow a grand list faster, bigger, better. But without the small increments of the facade, you might not attract that new shiny. <laughs> building. Thank you, hey, Matt. I, Matt, I was just going to say, if I could weigh in just uh, to kind of piggyback on what Joy was saying, you absolutely hit it. And I've been working with Joy and Bonnie and kind of trying to revamp in um, the redevelopment of authority. Um, and we've been talking about different ways in conjunction with Ken Slater of how, you know, if we are going to do a program like that, it, the guidelines are a lot more rigid. They're governed more by state statute. So if we were going to kind of pivot more into redevelopment, you know, what does that look like? What are our capabilities? What are some of the programs? So I think the intention, um, you know, based on my conversations with Joy is to really shift more towards that instead of not shifting away from the facade, because I think the facade improvement program has worked. And I think you've gotten a lot of buy in, especially from uh, business and businesses in town that utilize it. But uh, we're, we're trying to come up with effective ways, you know, with the help of um, obviously like working through state statute, how do we provide almost like a carrot to uh, some of these developers to come in and maybe even make make a physical, like you're saying, an ROI on some of these properties. So this is all sort of in the works. It's kind of just, it, it stinks that it's sort of right around budget time and, and it really hasn't been worked out to the level where, you know, we could specifically ask, this is, this is exactly how much money we're requesting specifically for redevelopment. Um, Matt, you uh, the joy of the facade improvement program isn't that a matching fund program? It is. Yep. So, it's a, know, it's the, a maximum of up to fifty percent. So we don't we don't fund all of it, and and the cap is at fifty thousand dollars. So, so uh, that, kind of, that means it's at least a hundred thousand dollar project. We're talking about seven hundred thousand dollars of um, not just looking good, but that's going to affect the assessed value of the property too right so you are getting some back in you know tangible if you will um just something to add to it does does the assessor go in and assess after the improvements are made reassess receive fauna on i think yeah. it's based off of the um the building permits but initially fauna, fauna would know much better than I would. <laughs> and I'm asking because I don't know the answer. <laughs> hi, hi, everybody. Um, yeah, I think it depends on the, the level of work that's being done at the property and if the income changes or not. Um, if you have a building um, where they maybe already had tenants in it and the tenants aren't going to pay any more money to be there, it's not going to change a lot because it's based on the income approach, right? 
but they're, when they renew their leases, they may be able to get more money from their tenants to be there. Um, the William Ravis building where the patio and hearth is, they, they did a wonderful job on that. And they're, they were able to get some amazing tenants in there after that. And the value, the value increased on that property. Pretty, pretty big, you know, a good amount. Um, I don't have any numbers in front of, you know, in front of me, cause we we're just talking about this topic. Um, but it does have added value. And like Joya said, you're not going to get somebody like the board in coming in and building this beautiful property. If all the properties around it are tired, dilapidated, you know, empty, you know, so there's, there's multiple levels of benefit to the town and value, you know, and that way you can bring in great tenants. We have a lot of development right now, a lot of people coming into Weathersfield and we don't want to lose that. We definitely want to keep that going. Thanks, Fauna. You're welcome. <clears throat> Any other questions for Joy? Uh, okay. <laughs> none. Thank Good. you. Um, all right, page uh, 27, tax collector. Marlene, you're up. Good evening. Um, there hasn't been too many changes to my budget. The increase mostly comes in the line items to pay for the tax bills because the cost increase for our provider, the paper and all those things he said goes up, the cost for them goes up, so they have to pass it on to us. And my education has gone up slightly as we knew, have a new technical assistant in the office who has to go to certification classes. The classes are $300 a piece and she does have to do four. She's already, she's in her second one. So there would be only two more to come in the next coming budget. <laughs> she would be done with that. Um, other than that, everything pretty much stays the same. I mean, the, heart, the legal advertisement stays up there because I'm required to publish the legal notice in a paper that publishes seven days a week, which is the Hartford Current. And we have to play, put it on a certain day. It's the rule of standard is 575. So sometimes that falls on a Sunday. That's their highest day to place an ad in the paper. Um, I have no control over that. That's state statute. That's really all the increase that's in mine. Marlene, the, the pension went down. Is that correct? Uh, yes. That's because some someone retired or left or? Uh, yeah, somebody moved to the town clerk's office. Okay. Marlene, have our collections changed since COVID? In other words, are we having trouble collecting taxes and is it impacting the budget at all? Um, I would have to say no. I, we've remained fairly the same. The numbers have still been there. As, as of today, right now on current levy, I'm at 99.8%. Um, the budget overall is at 100.14% as of today. And I still have alias tax warrants to send out. So we still have more collecting to do. And I've just recently sent another round of notices to the real estate too. I must tell you out of my, all my years of service, this girl is amazing. Her numbers are so high on collection. She does an awesome job. You should be very happy you have her. Thank you. Thank you, Marlene. And those numbers are amazing, 99.8. Yeah. yeah. Everybody's paying their taxes or you're collecting for everybody. Thank you. She is. She's yeah. a slave driver. <laughs> Any tax sales coming up anytime soon? She just we had one, one today. Yep, we had one today. We started with nine properties in January and I went to sale with two of them today. One of them was a lot that the Conservation Trust actually purchased and it, it's in with their parcels. So that was good. They were very happy to get that. They were looking for a while to get that. And the other one was um, a house that was also bid on. They, we only ended up with two of them out of nine. And then the other seven, do they? Yeah, they, uh, paid. they paid. Okay. Mm -hmm. Seems pretty good. All Everybody right. Thanks. I think, right, everybody set? We can move over to the tax assessor, page 25. And I must tell you that Ms. Fauna is leaving us tomorrow's her last day. So 
We wish her well in our neighboring community of Newington. Lana, you yes. want to go up? All right. Yep. So page 25, um, we have, um, I think we are only supposed to touch on uh, major changes. Um, we, we took out an office machinery service, um, was a thousand last year. It's empty this year. Um, it really should be funded. We, I've been asking for a new printer copier since I started. That still hasn't happened, um, but we are, uh, we don't know when we're gonna be hit with heavy costs. It really should be reinstated. Um, only one of our machines is uh, under a contract. Everything else is not. Um, our, other, our other change was audits. Um, last year, we still were running our program with TMA, um, as well as we had put a, another line item in there where we contracted Chuck Feldham to do audits. Um, we never ended up getting that done this past year with all the staffing changes. Um, and we ended up doing a complete a uh, review of all the personal property accounts to clean those up and get those uh, better, better for the grand list, more collectible, better rate. Um, do you guys have any questions on on the budget? Want to first off, thank you for everything. Uh, good luck in Newington. I used to work with the assessor there, Tony O'Mickey years ago oh, yeah. when I was on the council. Yep. So <laughs> good, good luck there. I have um, two questions. Yep. One you may have may have covered, but it's on the assistant assessor position. Mm -hmm. um, at line two, it looks like the proposed 22-23 budget is a fair amount less in salary. Yep. So we, we had um, Marilee French, the former assistant assessor retired. Um, when she did that, we ended up having, we did some restructuring to better suit the needs of the office. And we promoted what was our technical assistant to the assistant assessor. Um, and then we created a new position called assessment specialist, where we were paying, we wanted that to attract a more, um, a, a more specific criteria. Um, and uh, so that person handles personal property. Um, so we increased uh, the pay on that higher than technical assistant, but lower than assistant assessor, which we had had in the budget. So that's why there's the reduction to the assistant assessor salary because we had a retirement. Got it, thank you. And then you. we did and a my, promotion. Yep. Got it, thank you. And my other question is around the senior tax relief that we've talked about, and I've seen the yes. advertising for that. Thank yep. you. At our budget hearing, uh, Monday night public hearing, we had some folks, seniors, talk about how difficult um, the, you know, budget and taxes and being on fixed income, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And I'm yeah. wondering with, you know, with us promoting this more, if in the early stages, if you've seen any more action or anybody uh, potentially asking questions or looking into this benefit, because I think it's an under, as we've talked, an underutilized mm -hmm. benefit. We've had a lot of questions. I don't think we've just necessarily had more applications yet. Um, they have till May 15th to file. They have to make so 15th. there's still more time. Um, and, and uh, you know, and I'm sure we're all guilty. We all end up waiting till last minute to do most of our filings. I think we've only gotten about 80 in so far, less than half, you know? So um, I think we usually get about 120, 150. Um, so I expect we'll see a little boost, but we won't know the effect of the advertising until probably closer to that time. We've gotten some questions. Most of the people make more money than, than would qualify for, um, so. Got it, thank you. And again, good luck. Appreciate thank all you. you've done. <laughs> yes, I have to uh, say good luck. We're gonna miss you, Fauna. Um, I do have two quick questions about some things that uh, uh, have changed in the town and mm -hmm. I guess the state handles them. Um, the solar exemption, I know we were mm -hmm. part of that lawsuit yeah, the, yep. a couple years we, back and you yep. answered one of the questions when the grand list numbers came out in the beginning of the year. Um, 
are those numbers finalized now? Or are we going to continue to the see current, any? The current grant list is finalized. There's nothing going to change as with anything to do with solar. We exempted them. Um, what we're trying to finalize is the past stuff, um, but it doesn't have anything to do with current. Current's all taken care of. Oh, good. And then <clears throat> our favorite topic for assessors lately has been group homes. Mm. Do we know how many group homes are in? Uh, we have about we have about nine. Nine group homes. Yep. Um, and I and uh, I got the budget book here. I think that I think that I took them off in our budgetary process. <clears throat> Court decisions, because we have those current laws possibly coming up. Um, and I didn't wanna leave the town open for potential loss and liability on that. Um, we did not exempt them. And I know CCM is tr trying to oppose this. <laughs> So we're kind of like in this middle. We don't know. The court case did not necessarily say every group home should be exempt. It, there is still criteria. Um, yep. From what I was looking at with ours, with our review of our M3 tax exempt applications, I didn't feel that any of them qualified even based on that court case. Um, I did not, but we have removed the potential loss in case we did lose that money. So we've already accounted for that. If we ended up, if we end up going to court and or or let's say this law doesn't pass and it supports them being taxable, then we will have that gain that we didn't account for, but we won't suffer a loss that we didn't account for. How much would that gain be? What are we um I think I think it's about because well, there's about nine of them. I want to say about 1.5 million in assessment. Mm. It's a decent amount, and these these houses ha are, you know, they're not cheap homes. You know, they have right. pretty good assessments. They're they're pretty good valued homes. Right. Um, that we would not be collecting any any taxes on. Okay. If you want, uh, I can get you the specific numbers on that. Sure. If okay. you would, that'd be great. And then you had, uh, we'd gotten an email from Bonnie, uh, reconfiguring yes. of the office staff. Yeah, so I'm not completely done yet. So that was, that was, just, that was just the budget part. Um, so I, I was gonna move on. Um, I don't think Mike, Mike came No, down. Mike's at another meeting. He's yeah, so Mike wanted me to go over the CNAF, that uh, budget, that portion of our budget for assessors. Uh, we have reval coming up, um, and let me share that screen. All right, so can you guys see that? Yeah, it's here. Okay, all right. So this is something that Mike and I put together every year. I don't know if you guys necessarily see this or not. Um, one thing that started occurring quite a while ago, pre-Bonnie, pre-Gary, is that um, I would try to allot more money towards Reval so that when Reval came, we had the money. One of the ways that we would go about, it seemed to cut the budget or cut expenses would be to take you know, drop it every year. Um, so we are again heading into reval. We don't we don't got the money saved. Um, we've also been underfunding our attorneys' fees. Um, and I was explaining to Mike, even if somebody brings a lawsuit against us that has no merit, it can still cost us five thousand dollars to get rid of it. Um, you know, there's still filing fees. We still have to answer to requests and complaints and um, 
it's not it's not cheap it's not free um so this is this is what we've put together um i estimated on the higher end for a reval coming up um we're we're estimating around 200,000 because i don't know what the next assessor is going to be able to do themselves what they're capable of doing what they're going to want the reval company to do um, I cut our costs significantly last time because I personally did all of the informal reviews. I reviewed our commercials um, and we also uh, personally in the office entered all the data mailers. That's a huge savings that we did. Um, I don't know what the next person's going to do. Um, I would have to say that due to the staffing in the office um, that we are really down a person and that is coming up. Um, I, I wouldn't recommend doing the data mailer entry unless we get more people in the office. It's very time consuming, um, but to have someone else to do it's pretty expensive. Um, we, we have put pictometry, there's, there's an aerial photography. The vendor we use is called pictometry. Uh, we just got one done, which is fantastic. Derek was on, Derek Greger was on board with that. And we got that through and that cost is pretty minimal for how many people can view this and use this. Um, we did buy that and we're going to get that added to our map geo software that everybody can access online. Um, and, and everybody will be able to actually use that and see that aerial imagery that was just flown. Um, so the townspeople will be able to use it and see it as well. Um, doesn't need to be every year. Wish list would be every year, but um, but I think we would we would be happy with every other. Um, the Pictometry Connect software that had been coming out of data services. It's it's on here now. I don't know if it'll still go to data services. Um, but that's the analysis of the analysis of that. And, why, that and where is, it's coming from. Do we use data services? Data you service said, that would be Mike's. Mike's portion of, of data, I think data services falls under Mike as well, that Got department. It. So that's what we're looking at for revaluation. Um, we, it's a statistical, we wouldn't pay obviously to have boots on the ground. Last time we uh, did the data mailers, instead of having people knock on every door, um, we, we probably saved about $300,000 on that. Okay. by using software like pictometry and doing data mailers and going through them ourselves. I see we have legal fees. Have you yep. gone, have, is it routine practice for uh, folks to come in and question their uh, value or like valuation or their assessment, um, typically on like properties? Usually after reval is when we see our court cases. We don't really have anything pending right now except for one shopping center that's still carrying over from from um, reval. Okay. So, so we we don't have anything we're currently litigating. Um, I guess my thought is to fund it on a regular basis so that when you need the money, it's there instead of asking. All of a sudden, asking for one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars because you're short. Okay. And they do. You, typically, they come in after. I mean, it looks like in nineteen was reval. So in yep twenty, it jumped up to eighty-three and yeah. changed. And a yeah. lot of that has to do with that with that solar as well. Okay. That's in there. Gotcha. But we did do one trial. Okay. So that's CNEF. Any questions for yep. following on CNEF? CNEF. Reval. Okay. Seeing none. Uh, I think we're on to the police. Uh, oh, oh, I just I just wanted to quickly talk about the, the position. I won't yeah. I won't take up too much time. You guys can read. Um, but uh, so in obviously, if I've been with the town for almost seven years, 
Um, I suspected when I when I took the position that there probably wasn't enough staff. Um, that ended up being the case, but um, but we did review our parcel counts. So that's the number of parcels, real estate parcels that our town has versus comparable towns. Um, the town with the lowest number of staff similar in size to ours was Farmington with 3.5 people. Weathersfield's three. Guilford has four. Vernon has four. Stonington has four. Rocky Hill has four. Um, we have three. Um, so, I mean, in, in this time where we're wondering where we could possibly be able to make more money um, and, and grow the ground list, I think one of the best things you can do is actually fund the department that can, you know, has the capability of growing the ground list. Um, in that paperwork that you were sent today, um, possible cost savings could be that, the, that we could perform our own audits. Um, the assessment specialist is very eager to be able to do that. Um, we could cut that $5,000 cost from our budget. But in doing that, we can also perform more audits than that, than that auditor would perform where he'd only do 10. And we can do as many as we want. Um, that would allow us to collect the taxes from any for any assets found in the prior three years, as well as secure correct numbers to go forward, also growing the grand list. Um, the data mailers with that I was talking about, if we choose to do those again, ex adding that extra person, um, that could be a huge, a huge savings that that person, it could be 40 to $50,000 um, off the revaluation budget. A very small thing could be that this person can cross train with the tax collector's office, um, eliminating uh, that issue where they have to hire part-time help every summer, have to go through that hiring process every year um, and that additional expense. Non-monetary would be, you could retain hardworking employees to prevent turnover, high turnover and burnout, be able to get an assessor. They're gonna know where we probably understaffed um, and expand. One of the things we, we really, like to do and that we're really working on already is expanding our tax pay, taxpayer resident customer relations, especially with personal property. We'd also like to have that out with um, real estate as well, having our staff out in the field and being able to do inspections more, I, I think would be a very uh, resident taxpayer friendly thing to do. Um, the bottom line of adding this person would be growing the grand list. Um, we spend a lot of time with customers on the phone. We know that's always going to happen, but if we're short staffed, um, that takes time away from everybody else to being able to grow the grand list. Um, as we all know, the town is mostly built out, um, but one of the best things we can do outside of more growth is making sure that we are capturing everything that is here. Um, having that extra person will allow uh, the assessor, the assistant assessor, the assessment specialist to be out to do more inspections. Um, so in addition today, through this together today, I also um, arrayed the staff by the amount of the grand list. Um, and when I arrayed that, we had Rocky Hills about a 2.2 billion, four people, Weathersfield 2.3, and this is 2019 numbers. Uh, Weathersfield 2.3 uh, billion, ten, uh, three people, Bloomfield 2.3, two four people, Newington 2.6, four people. I, so, I mean, it's, I know from personal experience, you know, I've been in the office long enough uh, to know that we're not doing the best that we can do for our grand list as a town. So, um, so I put this together. Obviously, it's my day before my last day, but I think it's very important. It's very important for the town that um, that they are aware that this is this is an issue. 
So Fauna, are you looking for a part-time person or a full-time? I am looking for anything that you would give us. Um, we, we had a technical assistant. I felt for the person being really kind of in the office only, they're gonna be answering the phones and dealing with customers at the counter that we, we bumped it down to a clerk too. Um, that salary is 46068, but with benefits, um, they gave me a total of 82,919. I don't have a way to verify it, that. That's just what they, that's what they told me. But, you know, that would be a full-time position. But I honestly, I, I think anything, if you guys wanted to, to fund a part-time, anything you guys can, can do. I think would be really appreciated. And it would be more attractive to any successor yeah. team. Yes, yeah, yes. Mike, if I could. Yes. Uh, Fawn, I have one question and it doesn't relate yep. at all to the position. I fully understand okay. where you're coming from with that. Okay. The, the audits. Yes. Sometimes uh, I'm not sure if we in the past used uh, an outside firm on a contingency basis. I know other yes, towns do that. Yes. Yes. Tax. We what's did. Your, tax. What's, your, uh, what's your feeling about that system based versus doing it on our own? We um, have, I want to say, I think the statistics that I ran at that time. TMA will only tax management associates. We, we did have them and they were phenomenal. They're only gonna audit accounts. I think that that had a, an assessment of like 40,000 or more. Okay. The majority of our accounts, and I think that was about 250 accounts. We have 1600. The majority of our accounts, which they're not even gonna look at, fall below that. So let's say you had an account where they were telling us 25,000 they're not going to come in. They're not going to fall under that audit threshold. So, hey, you know, our new, my tech, my new uh, specialist goes out and finds out they have all these unregistered motor vehicles. They have this $500,000 copier, you know, and, and they wouldn't be audited because they weren't valued enough. So this would allow us, you know, more time right. to be able to spend and go do that. It, you know, it's not that we're going after people, but we're making sure that that person's being treated the same as the other one. Um, and that, and I think that's the most important thing. And if that helps grow the grand list at the same time, which it probably will, um, it, you know, that's, that's a positive for the town. No, thanks. I, I wasn't thinking about, it. it's not worth their while to go after the small fish. Yeah, you know, cause they, when they first came out, they would even do inspections, which is great. Inspections, they get the books, they go, they go wherever the accounting records were located. So they really have a threshold that they've got to make enough money, be able to make enough money on, on the project. It didn't cost us anything to run that project, you know, because we paid them based on a portion of what we, we collected. So uh, it didn't cost us any money to do that. I think it's a phenomenal program, but we just did it. So we won't want to probably do that for another 10 years because we do have all those audits that were performed for those companies. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions for Fauna? Well, sorry to see you go, Fauna. I miss everybody. It was great working with all you. I still got to make it through tomorrow without crying. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Take care. Best you of too. luck to you. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> we now have the police page 35. And I told the chief, this is his honeymoon budget and he only gets a honeymoon once. So, <laughs> Chief, do you wanna to introduce who is with you? Yes, thank you, Bonnie. Thank you everyone for allowing me to present today, this evening. Um, in the adjacent room next to me is my entire command staff or lieutenants, acting lieutenant Gonzalez, acting lieutenant Wren, um, acting lieutenant Booyak, lieutenant Conley, and Tanisha Murray, who's my uh, budget analyst. Um, they're um, with us to participate in this budget presentation. Um, 
So without further ado, if you allow me, I'll share my screen and uh, we could start if that's okay. Is that good, Bonnie? Yeah, you should already have uh, screen sharing. There you go. There we go. Okay. Like I said, this is my recommendation for the 22-23 Police Department budget. Um, first, I would like to start out by just reiterating what our mission is. Uh, the mission of the Weathersfield Police Department is to deliver effective and responsible law enforcement and community-based services to all the citizens of the town and the state of Connecticut fairly and equitably. It will partner with the community to make Weathersfield a better place to live, visit, raise a family, and conduct business. Um, as I move forward with my tenure here, um, this is going to be updated, uh, but it is for now, but I want to incorporate it change it just a little bit to where I envision our department going in the future, more on the community-based side. This is our current uh, organizational chart. Um, you see it here now as it is. When we get to the end of the presentation, it's going to change based on my recommendations. Currently, you have the chief of police, the chief secretary, who technically is supposed to be confidential, um, and the four divisions. We have the detective division, which, over, which is overseen by Lieutenant Conley. He has five detectives in charge of doing general investigations, backgrounds, and pistol permits, one DEA task force officer, one juvenile division detective, two school, school resource officers, uh, and the two DARE officers and the cadet program. Lieutenant Ren sees the patrol division. He currently has the five sergeants. Um, which one of which is an admin sergeant, an A squad sergeant, B squad sergeant, C squad, relief sergeant, and the 22 crossing guards. And there's also a total of 22 patrol officers on the patrol division at this time. Under ASB, Administrative Services Bureau, which is overseen by Lieutenant Booyak, he's got planning and accreditation, which is one sergeant, one officer, the budget scheduling and staffing analyst, who is Tanisha Murray, FOIA civil litigation, which is vacant. That's one of the requests I'm looking for due to the fact that we are seeing an uptick in uh, FOIA requests and civil litigation um, for the police department. He's also overseeing the internal affairs unit, which we're gonna be revamping shortly. Um, the record unit supervisor, which is the shared role by Heather Jolly. Um, one record specialist and there's one clerk position. So that's to be one and one. The record specialist position right now is vacant and that needs to be filled. And last but not least, support services, which is overseen by Lieutenant Gonzalez. We have our training unit sergeant, which is Oscar Rivera, um, property control officer, our court liaison, liaison officer, which is vacant, traffic control officer, which is vacant, nine dispatchers, and the one part-time ACO. Currently, the Weathersfield the Police Department has 47 full-time sworn officers with an authorization of 49. It consists of 31 Caucasian males, eight Hispanics, one African-American, five Caucasian females, and two Hispanic females. Um, we are continuing our efforts on diversifying the department, not only by demographics, but also by experience, as we have been hiring more lateral officers. And with that, we go into our attrition. So far this year, we've had one officer retire, Detective Allison Sullivan, that's the one detective, and uh, we're gonna have one sergeant who's gonna retire at the end of May, who's Oscar Rivera, who's our training officer, which is gonna be a huge loss to this agency because he oversees a lot of the training and the needs of this department. So we're starting to develop um, a transition um, and transition to a new sergeant to take that role. And the next year, we're looking at five officers who are gonna be going to be retiring um because they're going to reach their 25 years of service and that's going to be in january um that's one lieutenant one acting lieutenant two detectives and one officer also in the upcoming year we have the potential of losing an additional four due to retirements because they're going to have reached their 20th year um and they can leave if they want to and that's another acting lieutenant acting sergeant a detective and an officer so what do we plan on doing to combat that um I feel it's necessary that we have to, we fought, we hire five officers during this year um, to make up for that. Um, we would like to employ entry level officers at this point, 
Um, it would take them at least nine months from the time of entering the academy to be fully effective on a road, which will push us out to March of next year when they're off probate, off, uh, excuse me, off their FTO and ready to be on patrol on their own. So that's going to leave us a gap between January and March where we're going to be down five officers, um, which I just said in the next point there. Uh, currently, this year, we had 138 certified and entry-level police officers apply to the Weathersfield Police Department. 81 were entry-level and 57 were certified police officers. Of the 57 certified police officers, we have hired eight uh, this year, bringing our staffing levels up. Uh, there are currently 13 entry-level applicants actively in the process, um, but due to the unsuitability of some of the entry level applicants, we've kind of shifted our hiring plan and have gone more with the certified officer um, who have already been vetted, who are qualified, who have been trained and who we can get on, get on the road um, uh, quite quickly. Um, I'm gonna to touch on a patrol division. This is what, you, what we experienced <coughs> last year. We had a 17% increase in cost for service. Um, we investigated over 2,881 uh, complaints, which required an incident report. We made 528 criminal arrests, which is a 24% increase. Um, and we investigated 526 accidents, which was a 22% decrease. Uh, we've also increased our motor vehicle stops by 28%. Um, the issuance of infractions and summons there's really no significant change with a 2% decrease. Uh, there's no de no change in our DWI arrests at 64. And we've decreased the issuance of parking tags to 186 compared to the year prior. Our detective division, as you know, the detective bureau is in charge of investigating more of our complex investigations, which are time consuming, um, that can lead to um, and able to avoid us impacting our overtime, we remove it from the patrol division and give it to our detective division. Now, last year, they investigated 885, 100, excuse me, 185 uh, complex investigations resulting in 26 criminal arrests. Um, but the big bulk of the work, a lot of it, uh, 300 gun, 350 gun permits were processed during last year. Doesn't mean they were issued, they were just processed. And we also conducted 70 employment, employment backgrounds uh, checks for uh, individuals who were either from fire, PD, ambulance, or accessing the police department. Our support services, animal control calls decreased by 18%, um, impounded 29 dogs or animals at 12% decrease. Tr prisoner transports remained the same at 85 last year, transporting from the PD to the court, um, evidence processed, cases that reduced by 11%. Traffic speed surveys completed only four, um, which I would like to see an increase in that. And that will be the job function of the traffic unit uh, officer that I mentioned earlier in the org chart. Uh, selective enforcement increased by 43% and our installation of child safety seats also increased by 31%. Our PSAP, which Karen Tomchek oversees, um, as you know, we are here 24 hours a day, 365 days out of the year. We're responsible for the town. Um, we received an increase of 3% in nine cost for service via 911 at 11,214. Um, a decrease in dispatching of the Weathersfield Volunteer Fire Department, 761, and an increase in dispatching of ambulances at 3,266. This is just to highlight some of the training that some of our officers have gone to. Officers and civilian staff, i.e. our dispatchers, our Capital Region uh, Emergency Services Team, which is the Crest Team, the Tactical Team, um, which is shared responsibilities by the surrounding towns. Um, they train twice a month, so that could be uh, quite costly for us. We have our Mid-State Traffic Team, which is our accident reconstruction. They're also constantly training and or being deployed to investigate serious accidents to include fatalities. Our incident response team, regional incident management team, our peer support group, which we're starting to rebuild from the bottom up, um, our CTO communications training officer, 
That's a new program. It's just like our field training officer for our officers, but this is for our dispatchers, where our dispatchers are trained how to properly train incoming new dispatchers. Um, our emergency medical dispatching, the new Everbridge system now that we have that's being um, that's coming out of our dispatch center, our rapid SOS, our CPR first aid, NCIC collect, which is mandated, our our so recertification of our officers, which is an ongoing process because we have to be recertified every three years in our communication recertifications. One thing that we've implemented since I've been here is the new general order, which is unauthorized surreptitious recordings of individuals in the building. Um, they're no longer, we're, no, we're not recording individuals in the building without their knowledge. Um, things that we are mandated to do or complete by the state of Connecticut under the new accountability bill. Obviously, our use of force reporting, our now mandated drug testing of our officers, mental health, um, the advanced roadside impaired driving enforcement, which is a result of the legalization of marijuana, but that does not also incorporate the drug recognition expert training that I referred to prior um, with our officers trying to detect individuals driving under the influence of marijuana. As you can see there, our body-worn cameras have reached their three-year life, three life expectancy in 2021 and they need replacement. Um, there's only 35 of them that are used in the department now and they're constantly being used and changed over in the last, over the last two years and they are, are in dire need of replacement. Things I'm looking forward to doing this upcoming year, we're focusing more on community-based policing, being out and about in the towns engage in the community, being more active. Uh, we've created a PAL committee um, um, to implement a PAL program in town. Lieutenant Gonzalez is in charge of that. We're doing a re review of our fleet efficiency, which he's also in charge of as well. Um, I know you're all aware of the organizational climate study, which was just published. You should have all received a copy of that last night, which is 77 pages, which has approximately, I believe, close to 30 recommendations on how we can better um, move this department forward and make some effective change here, um, either through policy procedures or any other means of revamping our processes and succession planning career development. And that is a huge undertaking that needs to happen here at this police department, but it starts tonight. And that's the reason why our command, my command staff is on this call. If there's any questions you have, they're here to answer them. Um, from, like I said, the fleet to the PAL, to any initiatives we're doing because going forward, when I do have my full permanent command staff, we're gonna start uh, instituting, instituting all these initiatives. Um, so moving into restructuring our department organizational chart, we're trying to make our processes more efficient and effective our operations here at the PD. Um, overtime management initiatives to reduce the overtime budget that's now gonna be the responsibility. It was not in the past, but it's now going to be the responsibility of the lieutenants who oversee their divisions. They're gonna be responsible for their budgets on a weekly basis, determining where their money is going on overtime. Um, that way I have a better understanding and a better explanation for the town on where the money is going, i.e. snowstorm, significant incident, beta motor vehicle accidents, investigations, so forth and so on. Um, and that and that's coming. As you I just mentioned about the new lieutenants, we had the process on the 18th. They took the written exam. They're scheduled for the oral board on May 2nd. So once I get that final list, I hopefully can promote the next three permanent lieutenants to give me a full strength of four permanent lieutenants and then administer the sergeant's exam to backfill those positions. So I have full-time positions, not acting positions, uh, which makes uh, will make it a lot easier to start getting these initiatives implemented. So this is the new proposed chart or chart. You have the chief of police, you have the confidential secretary, which is Heather Jolly. She has a split role of the records unit supervisor. So it's kind of a, uh, a, an area where confidential, you would think that's non-unionized. And then now you have a record secretary, record secretary who is unionized. So there's kind of a sticking point there. Adjacent to her is the new captain's position that I, I am requesting, um, which is now going to oversee internal affairs, but it's also gonna draw a direct line right to the new unit that's gonna be changed from support services to professional standards. Underneath professional standards is gonna be the one lieutenant, 
training certification career development is also going to fall under there with the training sergeant and an officer to assist the training sergeant and making sure we are compliance with our, our recertifications and training for all the officers. You have planning, accreditation, CALEA, um, our policies, procedures that are being written and constantly reviewed. We just went through the CALEA assessment last week. Um, so I'm waiting on to hear the results from that. That's one sergeant right now and one officer. Uh, also under that umbrella is recruitment and retention, the cadets and the new PAL program, the two dear officers and FOIA litigation. I'm trying to keep it under that one umbrella with internal affairs, because as we know, when FOIA requests comes in, come in or is anything involving civil litigation, they all automatically want training records of the officers. They want anything and anything associated with any significant incident to include body worn camera video now, which is a new thing. Um, when we have uh, requests for um, instance involving officers, the first thing that's requested, they want the body worn camera video. And that takes time to process along with the FOIA requests. Our ASB administrative services lieutenant is now going to oversee the administrative sergeant, the property control court liaison. That's currently one officer. That should be two. Uh, the traffic unit officer, which is vacant, which I need to fill. That would be the one going out doing the, the traffic assessments, the surveys, the uh, moving of the speed truck um, cart, going out and surveying the the intersections and addressing complaints uh, that are brought forth by the community outside of normal patrol work. Uh, also gonna see the one part-time animal patrol officer, the 22 school crossing guards, um, our budget scheduling staffing analyst, Tanisha, our records unit supervisor, and the one records unit clerk and one records unit specialist. Um, they were all, that person would also oversee the fleet manager. He'd be the fleet manager and make sure that our building's being properly maintained, that we are up to, um, at least up to, up to code. Our patrol officer, patrol operations lieutenant will now oversee the three um, shifts, A squad, B squad, C squad, the patrol officers, the relief sergeant. But now I have moved dispatch, the communications unit, uh, under the patrol operations to make it easier for our dispatchers to be properly evaluated by a consistent supervisor on the same shift, uh, not just being super, uh, evaluated once a year by all sergeants. Now there'll be a responsibility of the sergeants on those shifts. And as you can see, I reduced the amount of staffing in ISB or Investigative Services Bureau, where we have our five detectives doing the general investigations, backgrounds, pistol permits, our task force officer and our juvenile investigations officer. Um, so that's where we're looking at now the captain spot here. I have a request in for another dispatcher to remove Karen Tomchak, who's our lead dispatcher out from her duties of doing dual role as a, as a supervisor and dispatcher. So she concentrate on the training, scheduling and making sure that we are compliant and standards with our dispatchers with the modern technology. And the additional officers are requested the five um, that are spread out in this org chart. So getting into our budget here, we have obviously our general fund, but our capital fund, our ARPA, excuse me, here. 350,000 of that 550,000 is for the replacement of the generator and 200,000 is replacement for the HVAC system. Um, that's under the capital fund. Under CNEF, uh, we have our four interceptors, our new watch guard camera service package, one year charge of 16,459 and our year one of five charge of 46,200,000. Going down to our Police general fund only. Obviously, the personnel, those are contractual. Um, that's why you see the increase. And then the non personnel that increase due to the inflation on items needed. Um, when you go through the budget line by line, there's really no, there's nothing in there that just 
everything that the increase is due to the cost of the items that we need to purchase to maintain um, our our functionality. So with that, I will open the floor. Thank you, Chief. Um, I guess real quick, and I probably already know the answer, but in your final slides, uh, with the increase, that does not take into account the new captain position, additional officers, or changing over for the dispatch position. That's correct. Okay. You can, well, I thought I had a busy desktop. That, that's busy. <laughs> uh, if you, if you want to uh, stop screen sharing, that way I can take a look and see who's. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. I thought I did. I love looking at your kids. They, good looking kids. Um, it was a very organized desktop. Yeah. I got to grab things from different corners of mine. Uh, so going back to, I, well, we got the budget in front of us line by line. So we'll talk about new positions uh, shortly. Um, anybody with any questions about the line items, uh, we can go through them and look at some increases. Um, Mayor, I, I, do have, I do have one question it, it, and it's really a general question. Chief, as, as a new chief putting your own stamp on this department, does this budget set you up for success or do you feel like there's still a lot more you need? And, you know, I, I'm looking at it as a new person coming in and, you know, you're, you're putting a new flavor to this and you want to set this up for success. Do you feel this budget is a step forward getting you there or do you feel you're still behind? This budget is flat. I'm coming in either behind or even because I've only been in this role for close to five months. So I'm still trying to evaluate the PD as a whole and where we need to go. We've taken great steps in hiring more officers to almost bring us up to the full staff, but we're not fully there. Um, and I need to start looking at other ways of being more efficient um, with this, within the agency. And that's what I'm doing now. Um, so this next year coming up is going to be the critical year to identify what the needs of the agency are. This is just getting me even right now and maintaining. Um, we're gonna get a true sense come next year when it comes budget season, when we start breaking it down by division and by the true needs and workload of the agency. We're running right now with a patrol staff uh, on a good day, one supervisor, five officers, but the majority of the time, the patrol staff is a one in three which is one supervisor and three officers. So when you're running a one three and you have an officer and I'm looking at our numbers for um, last year compared to this year, say that you, we respond to a mostly disturbed person. Last year, they responded to 171 um, emotionally disturbed persons in the town of Wethersfield. Right now we're at 45 this year. When we have one officer respond to that, that means that's a two or three officer response which means when you have three officers responding to one call, you have no patrol officers in covering the town. That could be a problem. Um, and even if we recreate, increase our minimum staffing to one to four, you know, at least you have more leeway because if two officers respond, I have two covering town, or even if three, I still have one. But when we go to these types of calls, you have the one and three. When I say one and three, the three officers respond and then a supervisor, depending on what it is. So your whole patrol is in one area. Right. So we have to start looking at that to be able to maintain operations that we can still respond for cost of services, but however, still maintain operations for the town, just in case there's another call. So right now, um, I would say we're going to have to take a hard look at increasing our staffing levels at the patrol level. Thank you. Any other questions for the chief on our budget line or, or any questions? 
I don't. Yeah, I have a quick question about the body cameras. Or is that on? Is that in CNEF? I don't know if that's in the regular budget or CNEF. That is in CNEF. Oh, okay. I don't know if we're there yet, but I just I just had a quick question while before I forget it. Um, you mentioned they're at the end of their life. Is this something that they have to be replaced due to you know some? statutory thing or is it can they be used another year you know or is it just because it's recommended they you replace them every th three years or is it required when you first we first purchased these cameras they were purchased for three years um they're out of warranty there was only 35 purchased there were two types of cameras purchased um so these cameras are being constantly used over and over so they're out of warranty they're expired, they're failing, and we're mandated to have body-worn cameras. And that's everyone, not just the 35. So the new proposal in the CNEF, that is a, uh, that is a five-year program uh, with a refresh at three years. So we're getting the cameras from WatchGuard, one camera, one style camera, and, one, and a camera for every officer, to include me, because I'm technically mandated to wear one as well, when I interact with the community, that's 50 cameras. We're also going to a cloud-based storage system. We're going away from a hard um, secure, a hard uh, um, storage here at the facility. So it makes it easier, easier for us to download video or the courts for our requests or things of that nature. But more importantly, like I said, this is a five-year program we're going into with a refresh at year three, which means we get all new cameras at year three, um, in-car cameras, body cameras. That will get us to year five, but due to the decrease of over usage, that will hopefully get us to year six because they're brand new cameras. And then we can start replacing them again, once again, at year six. Here where we're stuck at three, now we're, now we're, ch we're changing them at year three. This will hopefully get us to a six more, six years out from now based on this new program. Okay, thanks. Tom? Yeah, if I could just kind of piggyback on what Mary was talking about with the cameras. You know, often when, when we have a situation where we have a large number of, of an item, it You're muted. Um, uh, sorry about that. Um, let me start over. Uh, with the cameras, um, when we're buying a multiple uh, quantity of, of a device like that, uh, with a, a predicted expire, you know, expiration of three years, it would be, I think it would make sense to try and phase that in with, you know, one third of the cameras each year, so that you're not in three years coming back and saying, I need another 250,000 or whatever that number might be. Uh, we, we have a situation with the fire department right now with, a, with the air packs where uh, the entire uh, fleet needs to be replaced because they've exceeded their, their life expectancy. Um, is there a way we can fate, gradually purchase new cameras over a, over a period of three years? Or? That would be the ideal program and that's why we're going to the five-year program of phasing them um but that wasn't done three years ago or four years ago they were bought outright and now we have cameras that were bought outright that are failing us so i can elaborate on that um Tim Gonzalez speaking so just like the chief um just mentioned that when they were originally purchased they were purchased outright um and we did pay for warranties every year on top of that um especially the in-car systems, we have 12 in-car systems. Eight of those are completely out of warranty. So anything that happens to them now, which one is failing, we have to pay out of pocket to replace. Um, the body cameras, like the chief alluded to, there are 35 purchased. And it's a little misleading of the 35, really only 20 are used primarily by the officers because it's a one camera system. Most officers prefer the single camera, not the, uh, it's a smaller camera with a, with a battery on your belt. So 
those cameras have been used 12 to 16 hours a day. And most of them have been replaced under warranty. Um, and we currently have 10 cameras that are awaiting replacement of the 35. And some have been waiting for replacement as far back as August. So now, of course, it's a supply issue with these companies to get these components to, to get us uh, warranty work out to us. Um, in a perfect world, it would be great to stagger it. Um, what, what wasn't very clear maybe is that this program is a lease, it's a lease program, but it's a lease to own. Um, and the technology is such that to stagger the technology, I think would almost be impossible because literally every three to four years, the technology changes that much. Um, again, this program is a five-year program. I'd like the Sheik mentioned at year three, they, they, they then replaced every camera and battery. And now that we'll have a camera and battery issued to individual officers, they're not gonna have that wear and tear. They're not gonna be run as, 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 uh, or used as consistently. So they really should last into, six, into that six year and could be beyond, frankly. So our savings will probably be on the back side of it. Um, this, this, other, this camera we're going to also is the newest camera with the, with the newest technology. And again, we're having trouble even getting replacements for these older cameras. Um, so I understand your logic in replacing in part, which was what we do with the fleet, which, which that will work. So we're not asking for you know eight new cars every year. But at this point with the cameras, based on the dire straits and the condition that they're in, it, it's not real feasible. That makes sense. Okay. Tom, can I ask a follow-up to that? Sure. Yeah, Anthony, is it possible to, instead of doing the lease to own, just to lease, almost like in a rental arrangement, and just a continual rental arrangement, would that be actually cheaper in the long run, as opposed to dealing with trying to find these parts and waiting and having breakdowns where you just continually, when there's an issue, you just get another one? Or so with the technology. Is that, I don't even know if that's feasible, but they do it. So it is, it is a lease program. It's a five-year commitment. But at the end of the five years, we own the equipment. And based on the use, it should last six, maybe seven years. Okay. So if we have to, after five years, we may have to enter into another, another agreement to lease equipment, or we may have a year or two of reprieve where we're just paying for warranty service and not a lease payment. The best part about the lease, like any lease, is if, if there's any uh, field loss or damage, you know, they, they send you a new one out within a couple days. It's immediately, all the equipment is replaced immediately with the lease program. So we are, it's a five-year lease if we commit to it, but at the end of the lease, we do own the product. And I believe we should be able to retain the product after outside of that lease program where, the, where there would be some savings on the back end as well. If, the, if there are technology upgrades, is that included in that? Yes, all from here, hardware upgrades are included. Okay, great, no, well, thank you. Mayor, if I could. Yes, sir. Thank you, so first of all, apologize, I got disconnected, the beauty of technology, so I'm sorry there. Uh, Chief, thank you for uh, all you do and your, your officers and for the update. I appreciate all that and appreciate the climate survey. I think it's really important. My question goes to the number of new officers and maybe you can clarify this and maybe I got it wrong. I think you said, I'm not looking at it right now, we have 47 now, we're authorized to go to 49, which would be two more, but you're looking for five more. So that's my first question. Is it to get up to 49 and add three? And then my second question is related. I think you said the five new ones you're looking for entry level, but I also understand and thought you said, you know, sometimes it's better to get certified officers because they're more experienced. So maybe you could tell me a little bit about the numbers first and then the thinking perhaps strategic upon entry level versus certified in the five new ones. Did you follow all that, Chief? I got you. All right, thanks. <laughs> I, I appreciate it. No, no worries. You know, we're staff, we're, we're budgeted for 49, so I want to fill those two spots. Um, right now, we're looking at another ladder row, and we have some entry level right now to fill those two to get us to the full 49 contingency. 
the five are going to be on top to start planning for the attrition come January. Um, I we prefer the entry level because they'll be at the academy at that time, get in training. They'll be trained. So by the time they get off, get off FTO and on the road, they'll be marched or ready to go. Um, if not, and we have to go with the laterals, which is a kind of a win-win because um, when we're looking at the expense of hiring a new officer and putting them through the academy, they're in the academy, during the academy, they're of no use to us at this time, but we're still paying a salary. So, so, so the first, the thank you. The first part I get 47 to 49, the five with attrition make, makes sense. The second part I'm not sure about, you, you, you said um, the preference is to get five new ones for the attrition as entry level. But then I think you said the laterals or the certified may be easier because they don't have to go to training. So do you have a preference on that, on which route to go? And is there a significant budget impact on that? It's twofold because we want to, we want to spread out our officers. I don't want to hire all. I'm looking at 25 years down the road. We have to we have to space out how we hire our officers okay. and space out how they retire. Um, I can't afford to lose like this year potentially nine officers. You know, this year to come January, I could lose nine officers. That's going to put us nine officers down um, from 49 to 40. Okay. Okay. That that's a huge loss in a, in one year. And then trying to make up for that training, trying to make up for that experience. So we have to figure out a way how to properly spread it out. Like I said, I would prefer the laterals because it's more cost efficient. They've already been trained. They've been through the academy. They have the, the experience on patrol. And it would probably cost me about $5,000 to outfit them and put them on the road after, uh, after FTO. Compared to hiring someone who's going to cost us $3,500 to send them to the academy. And then we're paying our salary through the academy. And then we hope they get off FTO and they make it. And we don't lose all that money if they don't make it. Um, so Got we have it. to be strategic that, on it. And we have these other vacancies that I want to look at, you know, making sure we can fill with the traffic unit officer um, and the uh, the additional position. So there's going to be a lot of maneuvering I'm going to have to do within the next couple months to year. Got it. Makes sense. My last question related to that uh, is what's the entry level salary now for a new officer here? Do you know? Uh, is? I think Lieutenant Booyak might know that off the top of his head. Right now, the entry, the entry level salary is 76,000. It's 6,000 below the starting salary of a, a new officer. So it's about 76,000. Got it. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Lieutenant. Thank you, Chief. All set, Mayor. Thank you. Tom? Yeah, uh, I'm still on the uh, five additional police officers. <clears throat> you're you're uh, talking about five hiring five in anticipation of five that are leaving are is your plan to increase the the, the normal count from 49 to 54 or are these going to be somewhat temporary positions in anticipation of filling the empty slots i'm i'm anticipating increasing our staffing to 54. so when Next year, we're still going to be down five when the when the five retire, right? Next year, I could be down nine if the other four retire as well. Okay. <clears throat> well the other question I have is about overtime. Does does hiring does putting uh, my thoughts were that if we're going to add officers, and I understand they're not all going on to patrol, but if we're going to add officers, wouldn't that suggest that the overtime should decrease? Well, the officers we hire are going to patrol. Um, they're going to be hired in entry level and they're going to go to patrol and then we'll make maneuvers within the agency um, to staff accordingly where we need to put them. Um, technically, it should decrease the overtime. However, I need to understand where the overtime is going, like I said early on. I have to sit down and do a full analysis with my full-time lieutenants in a division. And I want them to tell me exactly where their money is going by month. Uh, when a patrol, yeah, patrol is gonna be the bulk of our overtime because we have to staff the backfill individuals calling out sick, vacation time, things of that nature, or any major incident. So we're, I, 
really managing a budget on the patrol side, um, we can be reduce it next year, or we could be one incident away from going over, um, as we well we well know. And uh, that's what we have to start looking at this year with my lieutenants and I is how are we spending it on a monthly basis? When are our hot months, which is usually the summer, and when everyone's taking vacation, and obviously we have more individuals outside activities, parades, events, things of that nature, which are gonna drive my overtime up during those months. And we have to start planning accordingly, coming with a game, a game plan to control that. Uh, setting costs aside for a second, how many, what would be your optimum number of patrol uh, officers on the road on each shift? You're talking about one in three, one in four right now. Um, I personally would like to see more people on the road and less people in, in the station, but I, I have no knowledge of how to run a police department. So all these positions that you have in your work chart, I have to assume they're all required, but I, well, I would like to see our presence out on the road. And what what would that number be? Is it, is it six? Is it 10? I mean, I don't, I don't have an, any clue. So if you could. Well, I could tell you, uh, Deputy Mayor, that I walk the building every day. And the only officers in this building are my command staff and me or my inside sergeants. Um, so I don't know what the reference is to the officers being in the building or where that's coming from. I'm just uh, saying. Total number of employees. That's all I was. Um, oh, I'm just making reference to that. How I walk the building, and I I'm in, I assure you that the three officers that we have on patrol are on patrol. Um, if they're in the building, they either made an arrest, or they're working on paperwork due to an arrest, or they're processing evidence. Um, they're not in the building to be in the building. I don't believe in the officers sitting in the building to sit in the building. Um, that's over my 26 year career. Um, the officers are in the building, are assigned to their duties, which are my commanders, my inside sergeant, uh, my admin sergeant, and my training sergeant, who are thoroughly busy, uh, my uh, clear accreditation sergeant. Um, outside that is my civilian staff that's in the building. So in the perfect world on the road for patrol purposes for this town at this point, as it's growing, minimum patrol should be one to four at minimum. I will ideally like a one to five. Like I said earlier, when our officers respond for calls for service, and you take two officers to respond to a call, now you have one officer patrolling the town. That is, it's a tough thing to do, especially from an officer safety perspective, because that person has to go to a hot call. Now we're calling surrounding towns for uh, additional services. So one in four, likely two officers can handle a call. If it's a significant call, a third one can call, um, pull away, go to that call with the supervisor, and you still have one um, um, patrolling the town, if need be, doing your pretty much like your prevent defense in the, the world of football, because I like football, but um, that's where we're at. So in, a, in an ideal world, it's a one to four. And then that's, for, that's for all three shifts? Correct. So I would have assumed that there's more officers on the road during the daytime where there's, I would, would suspect more activity, but... Uh, maybe that's not the case. Uh, well, we're at the um, whim of the scheduling here, yeah. um, which we have to look at coming in upcoming year and how the schedule is done here um, to also look at that. But that's contractual that I have to look at when we come to the next year. So, okay. I, I, I don't know if I asked the question incorrectly or you mistook it the right wrong way. I, wasn't trying to infer that people were sitting around not doing their job. I was trying to understand how many people required to run a police department versus how many are out on the road. That that was the question, not not that people were not not doing their job. So apologize if I conveyed that incorrectly. No worries. Any other questions? Um, if we go to CNEF real quick, and I'm sorry, I had to sneak out real quick, but um, 
I think Officer Gonzalez was talking about the new vehicles. Was that discussed, if I'm not mistaken? No, we didn't discuss it, but uh, Lieutenant Gonzalez is prepared to discuss the uh, fleet uh, efficiency program that we're starting to develop here. So, Lieutenant Gonzalez. Yes, um, any specific questions first before I just generally give you an overview? No, go right ahead. So, in the past, I think most of you are aware, um, the system that was in, in place was uh, we would put in for new vehicles. Those new vehicles would go to the chief usually you're the lieutenants in an admin capacity for at least a year, up to two, two and a half years, and then they would move into patrol. So they were uh, purchased, um, they were upfitted to admin capacity, which the basic lights and uh, but no computer, no, no video, no watch guard, um, and then would come to patrol at a, at a later date. That seemed to have worked for a long time here. Uh, at first, they have been here almost 24 years. And, and luckily, COVID has kind of saved us in that police work in the world has slowed down. So our fleet has had some reprieve. Um, but after speaking with the chief and, and, and looking at what other departments do, we are gonna implement a plan with the, the four cars coming in this year of putting them right into patrol, outfitting them up, for patrol immediately is brand new cars. Um, the first reason being is that we're not, we historically have never gotten the warranties out of the cars that we pay for when they go to an admin capacity or um, a non-patrol capacity, we're losing those, uh, those years on the warranty, which add up pretty quickly. Um, never mind taking into account the time it takes to upfit the cars when they come in. So. Unfortunately, when cars were coming in all at once, which isn't the case right now, but we would have brand new cars sitting waiting to be upfitted, um, which now we've moved to doing some of the electrical upfitting to an outside vendor where we purchased the cars, which is MHQ in Middletown. Um, this philosophy, kind of like the body cameras, so in, in the past, whenever we had two or three shiny new cars come to patrol, um, like, like human nature, those, the officers want to drive the new cars. Um, and when you have a new car, that car gets driven 24 hours a day. So it doesn't take that long to beat up a new car. So with the four new cars coming in and only one car has come in thus far, um, we're gonna get those cars into patrol and then there's three cars coming in behind it. So we're gonna have some newer cars and we're gonna monitor the mileage much more frequently in idle time. So we have that three to four car replacement every couple of years. Um, this way we won't have cars getting beat up. If there are any issues with the cars, normally it's in the first 50,000 miles or less, especially the way we drive. Um, we, just, we just had to replace a, a transmission in a car in a 2019 that, that basically it went 60,000 miles. If that car came to patrol, a, it's most likely that transmission would have went in the first year or two and would have been under warranty. It was out of warranty because it came from an admin capacity. So by the time the transmission went, that was an out-of-pocket expense that we just had to pay for about two months ago. So this new program of getting newer cars to patrol and doing a better job my, uh, monitoring, the, again, the mileage and the idle time will ensure that the cars aren't getting beat up and we can cycle them out in a more efficient manner. Any okay. Other? Nope. Thank you on that. Any um, questions? One, one more, uh, if I could. How many cars right now are outfitted as patrol vehicles? We have a supervisor's car, and then we have our line units or districts two through eight, seven and eight being spares. So they are high mileage, but they're still fully out outfitted with a computer. Um, the in-car video system. So when uh, one of the newer patrol units is down for service, we have two active spares. What this new program will do is increase, increase that a little bit because we have a canine vehicle coming back to us since, since we have one canine uh, unit now instead of two. It's gonna allow us to rest some vehicles. So like anything else, if we can reduce the, the even the idle time down to eight to 12 hours, on average, 
the life of the car is going to increase immensely. And as cars get, as, as certain car mileage increases for whatever reason, we could rest that car for a week, two weeks, three weeks. So we don't have this influx of, of problems. Now, I don't want to, we're not going to monitor to a point where we have all the cars with the same mileage. So they're all getting old at the same time. We're going to tier it. Like I said, it would be a three level tier. So then we'll have a better efficient um, cycling of the cars coming off patrol, going into a, uh, you know, a traffic or reserve type function, and then and then going off off to the town or auction. The last couple of years, and, and, and Sally and, and Heather could could um, could also validate it. The cars we've turned in historically, we've tried to keep some for the town. There's some departments in town they always want a, a spare car and usually want a, a, a police car. Our cars have been run so bad and, and are in such rough shape, they're not worth keeping anymore. So that's another that's another negative. I, again, if if we took better care of them and cycled them through, we may be able to hang on to more as a civilian car for another town employee, like we used to. And then I just have one more follow up. That was, I think I saw it the last time we purchased uh, patrol vehicles. We had a line item in there for like deductible for insurance. Do you know what that was about? It was like $550 or something like that. It seemed strange that it was included in the cost of the car. So, yes, we do budget for the deductible in case it's needed for a claim on the car. Um, why? That's the way I was trained and I've told, I've told we have done that. Depending, uh, we also have applied and, and have also purchased extended warranties on the car. But that deductible, it may be a KERMA stipulation, but we have budgeted for it and it's for if there's a claim on the car. Okay, thank you. It's not always due that money Heather again would know for Sally that money is not always being used unless there's claims. Thanks. Here. Tom, you all set? Yep. A um, couple of quick questions about the cars. Um, understanding why, why, and this is, I don't want this to be as obvious as it sounds, hopefully. Why is the why are we getting rid of the cars? Is it because of the transmissions, the engines, the exhaust? Like, what is it that sort of physically breaks that you think that we need to replace the car or something else? Industry standards is roughly eighty thousand miles for a patrol ready car. You're, you're not going to want um, people patrolling your neighborhoods with cars that have excessive mileage. With excessive mileage is wear and tear, and and they're not. They, they, they tend to lose there because they're police rated, uh, which although we're not going on pursuits every day anymore, we still do pursue people and need to pursue people. So ultimately the mileage is what drives it, drives these cars. But what, well, the, but the mileage is because the engine will break because you don't have enough acceleration in order to do a chase because but what is, what is the, it's miles, but it's miles because of something, right? So what's the reason that you wouldn't put an $80,000, 80,000 mile car in there? It's just, it's a less, a less reliable and safe car. Um, idle time is a big part of the, it's, it's even sometimes more of a, a, an engine killer than, than mileage. Obviously so it drives highway miles, it puts a lot of miles on a car. Those cars sometimes can still be pretty, pretty tight and sound, but we have a, we have a combination of drive time and idle time. Now, historically, that type of information is ne not necessarily being monitored. Um, they did have software with Town Garage that did, did do some of that, and they just recently have some software up and running that's gonna start monitoring that again. And again, we've been asking for, there should be some monitoring of gas consumption as well. Um, when you're talking about idle time, you're talking about because the engine is still running, it's still putting wear and tear on that engine, and therefore there's a, high, a less reliability the engine's going to perform either, either perform or just work as appropriate. Is that what we're getting at? Yes. Okay. So if I get you a car that the engine doesn't break and the transmission doesn't break, we could actually have these cars last a lot longer. If you're referring to electric cars, I, I could absolutely touch on that for you. Yeah. I mean, that is what I'm referring to because there's a lack of 
gear transmissions and the engines are rated for over a million miles. So, but, but I'm asking like, is it now like, you know, in, in year four, when we would hit 8,000 miles, the suspension's still going to go anyways, you know, or something like that, that I don't know. I'm trying to get some perspective here. Sure. And obviously besides the mileage, if an older car is less efficient, it's going to burn more gas. It's going to require more repair. But um, I wasn't asked before. I already put my budget in for the cars before I was asked to look into, um, or the chief did ask me to look into to the option of, of going with electric vehicles. Obviously, yeah. if you're familiar with Westport, I spoke with them at Lang. I'm there for Ram. Um, and it is it is viable to a certain degree. Uh, Officer Sampson, along with their chief, <coughs> ran up and running at Westport. Uh, they're very fortunate to have a showroom in their town. They're very fortunate to have a, a service station in New York that they use. Um, and they've been kind of pioneering, you know, the upfitting of that car to be a police car. They did finally establish a fleet division at Tesla six months ago. That's going to make it easier for um, companies, departments to look at Tesla as an option. The bottom line is we still need to, we still need to purchase a fleet vehicle and a police vehicle. There's a vehicle made for police work. Um, Personally, yeah, I'm not, I'm not thinking that, you know, we're going to solve this in this budget cycle necessarily. And I think there's definitely some more research to go, but I'm trying to understand, like, you know, as far as maintenance and why, you know, would, if we could have a machine that would withstand and be reliable over a longer time, <coughs> is there any other reason that, you know, we couldn't, we couldn't start entering the fleet and then seeing those savings? Sure. So even Westport, they recommended if you're going to go to it to start with an admin capacity. Mm. Would, they wouldn't recommend putting them right to patrol. Their their Model Three is in patrol. It used to work two. It used to run for two shifts, day shift. They charge it on evenings, and then the midnight officer would use it. It's down to one shift right now. Mm. They they're, they purchased a, a Model Y, and that's being updated still, um, and that's going to be more of a permanent patrol vehicle. But to truly garner the savings in emissions and gas and wear and tear, if the car is not in patrol per se, you're not gonna have those big savings up front. You will have the savings initially that first year. Right. But until, until they're until they're vetted and like, so Ford, Ford came out with the Lightning pickup and they came out with the Mach-E. The Mach-E, in my opinion, is something we, we should look at seriously for next year. That's all electric. You can get an all-wheel drive. It's already been vetted by the Michigan State Police. It's it's actually pursuit rated, so it's actually a police car. And Ford already has a fleet program set up, so they're very familiar with upfitting and working with departments and companies, so these vehicles can be upfitted for government use. Um, and it's American, and I don't know if personally. I'm only I only have about a year and four months left, but. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to continue to push for American cars um, and talking to Samson and Westport, and he's, he has a good contact with Tesla. Until Tesla opens up a little bit and allows some of the technology to be used and shared, whether it be like with a light package, they have great cameras, as you know, but if there's no interface for the police package to have access to their camera package, we're still buying cameras to put in that car. Right now, I think Tesla is going to be a little hesitant to share technology and let Americans into their car, where I feel more comfortable with Ford because they're American and we, they already make police cars. Like I said, I think the that Mach-E, if you haven't seen it, is very nice. It's already, it's, it's just past being uh, pursuit rated, which is still a very important concern to have. So that's something that's really viable, I think, for next year. Um, okay. Thank you for that insight. Appreciate it. Just as a heads up, you know, Tesla's made in Texas and California, and it's probably one of those American cars on the road these days, uh, as far as its components are usually vertically integrated within the United States. Just some thoughts on that one. But I understand that there's definitely Not multiple integrated to police packages yet. And I'm getting this information from, from, from Westport. Sure. Westport's sure. really working with them to get them to, to make it more convenient, you know, because Whalen wants to work with them. Um, there's a, a couple um, the Satina and Havis are companies that do outfitting for the cages for prisoner transport. 
and our, our consoles and everything, they are just starting to make packages to fit Tesla. So once these other outfitters, manufacturers start to make more products to make it more viable, it'll be, it'll be easier. It'll be an easier transition. You might want to convince the politicians in Connecticut to allow, allow them to sell Teslas in Connecticut. To me, that's going to be a big, big issue because they can't. And the other issue is maintenance. They're, they don't require much maintenance in that Model 3 in Westport. They've only had to replace the battery, which they were, which they, which Tesla replaced for free, and uh, one wheel and rim because someone hit a curb. Sure. Um, that's great, but the car hasn't been in an accident either. And I know people personally that have Teslas that have been in accidents. And until until there's a better system of fixing cars, I'm not sure the police service can wait or emergency services can wait months for cars to get fixed so that that's where i think tesla is going to be a little behind that's just my opinion understood thank you for looking into that appreciate it no problem any further questions while well, we have the lieutenants and the chief on okay so, uh, Mayor, I was going to say, Anthony, you said you're done in five months? Uh, no, a year, a year and five months, but I'm not counting. Just to go sh to show you how old I am, I remember when you first came on. <laughs> That's a true story. Uh, remember when you lived out Dorchester? Yeah, that's right. Oh, boy. We may have even had mounted police at that point on horses. <laughs> <laughs> They're efficient. I was waiting for the Dan O'Connor old comment. You know, like I did, I did to my we talk, Were you there when Wyatt Earp was hired? <laughs> um, don't open yourself up. Yeah, I, I saved you. You're all mine. I gave it directly to Dan. Okay. I think we're good. Obviously, yeah. there's a lot to deliberate. Are you ready for the town clerk? Sure. All right, Miss Susan, you're up. Page 15 for her. Thank you, buddy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Let me just change my papers around here. Okay. Oh boy. Of course now the dog starts. Um, okay. Um, so starting with um, the overtime line, um, I just re took that out um, the whole amount because it hadn't been used in the past, but um, as things get busier, especially with elections, it's something I might have to revisit in the future. Um, the next line was for the, um, health insurance oh. and that, um, that decreased this year because, um, uh, Lynn, uh, does not, she opts out of the town's health insurance and, um, the professional services that was, uh, decreased. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, and um, that's the that's where I uh, take the money to do the uh, audits and they're still doing the audits from 2021. Um, and there's still almost 5,000 documents left. So um, I still have $2,500 that I need to pay for those. And then I'm estimating that um, this current year, we'll have about $2,100 for, that's just an estimate on the, this year's upcoming documents. Um, and in the support services, th that, uh, there's an increase there, and that's, we have to microfilm all the land records that are recorded and everything that um, we make the volumes, but that all has to go on microfilm, and that's, uh, 
that's what that is for. Um, and then the specialized agency supplies. Um, that's all based on the land records um, for the paper that we use. It's very expensive um, and the volumes, but we're just still seeing the, well, the land records have tapered off a little bit, but it would, you know, we do about um, at least 10 volumes and there's 1200 pages in a volume. And then also the state has implemented the new death registry. And with that new death registry, now that each town is responsible to print out all the death records where before um, the towns of occurrence would send the copies to us. So like if people passed away a lot in hospital towns, which the majority, you know, a lot of people do, they, we would get all those copies from those corresponding towns, but now we have to actually print those out ourselves. And uh, the birth records had changed over to that in 2017. So we're printing a lot more uh, vital records ourselves on the archival paper than we were before. Um, and just the land record binders are also very expensive. Um, and I think that covers it. So you want to talk about your position? Uh, sure. So um, I've requested that um, the part-time position in the office um, that takes care of all the council duties, that she have her position increased to full-time. Um, there's an awful lot besides, you know, that goes along with the council duties. Um, the most tedious one is the minutes, but then she also takes care of uh, all the boards and commissions, um, all the changes, which that's just like a, a moving target all the time. Those are people are constantly resigning and being appointed. And she takes care of all the, the dates, the meeting dates for all the boards and commissions, uh, the votes book, um, which is all the swearing in of people and um, so there's just an awful lot that's involved with that. And then the office is just so busy that there's constant interruptions. Um, so there just doesn't seem to be enough hours in the day for, for Lynn to keep up with all the, all the things that ha have been constantly changing now with the new election laws. There's a lot for the office to do. And when one person gets overloaded, everybody tries to shift to compensate and invariably something gets lost in the shuffle or put on hold. Is that in the, uh, do we have that page five? Yeah, also I sent you a backup Sue gave me, I sent it over today. Clerk to full time, part time. Yeah. Yes. Is that sixty five thousand six hundred sixty four? Is that an just an amount that's in addition, or is that the would that be the salary of the full time employee, or is that like the additional amount of money that you would need? No, I believe that's the salary. Okay. Um, anybody have, I have any more oh, questions? I have, I have one more question. Sure. Um, when you said microfilm, I was, I haven't heard that in so oh. long. <laughs> and I thought, oh, I can't believe we do this. But is this a requirement of the state that it has to be in this format? Um, yes. And as far as I know, it's still microfilm. Um, we get a list every year from Adkins of what they have and you know they keep updating it each year as as we give them more to do so it is a requirement of the state to keep everything in case there was a natural disaster we lost the vault um you know we would have to have something you know to recreate all those records 
Oh, interesting. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, and I, I think it still is microfilm, although they may have changed how they do it. Um, I should check into that just so I know, but that's what we always call it. And that's just what I, okay. yeah, I always refer to it that way. That's what the invoice says. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Sure. Um, so when was the last time, I mean, as you are uh, um, under the purview of the council, when was the last time we determined a uh, pay raise or pay increase for you? For Do you me, know what, which month it was? was um, it I don't know if it was maybe when I was appointed in January of last year. I think it is January. Okay, so this uh, this budget doesn't account for any increase. Um, I, I don't. We probably won't. not because we, you know, we you guys have to kind of vote on that. Put it forward. Yep. Yeah, I, I, we, I, didn't, uh, I didn't even look at that honestly. Uh, so we all filled out our surveys. Yeah. And yeah, and I, you, uh, Claudia did a um, summary, and I think you have that, Mike. Yes. And it falls on my lap that I have not uh, um, sat down with you, Sue, uh, to go over that. But that's not a problem. I know everybody's busy. So, so we will. Um, yeah, there was no, nothing bad in the review at all. So that's, uh, very you. Positive. <laughs> that's good. So uh, we would look to see that that increases, uh, I'm sure. I have one, Mike, if I could. Sure. On, uh, you have one item, Sue, on uh, CNEF. Yes. For land records. Yes. 190,000. And um, I, I think I understand the basic concept. And my question is, um do we get do we gain any revenue by uh, uh people requesting that electronically uh versus coming into the office um, um i think i think that how the or does it off uh does it offset does does it offset the amount of time that your staff has to spend helping people find what they need and that kind of thing? Absolutely. Um, we have been um, actually getting a lot of subscriptions um, during, in the beginning of COVID when it first started, we were running around like chickens with our head cut off because people weren't coming in. They needed copies and we were making the copies um, and uh we had to copy them first and then send them through the scanner because we couldn't put the pages through. So um, it was very time consuming. And then what we did was um, we let people use um, the system on the honor system. And we said, you know, because it's COVID, we'll give you access to the system. Um, please just send us your copy money when you, when, when it's convenient for you. Um, but that kind of, some people did and some people took advantage. So um, I ended up having to turn that off and we started collecting subscriptions. So um, currently we it's $125 a month or $250 for six months. And we have quite a good base now of people that are getting the six month subscriptions and it's convenient for them. Um, but the only thing that's not convenient is that they can't do a, um, a full search from home because we don't have the land records going back that far that are on the system. Um, and then the other thing about this also is that um, there's an, another additional piece, which is, uh, I think it's $5,000. It ends up being $83 a month after we do this. But if you wanted to look up your land records online, you would be able to go onto the system and then with a credit card pay 
whatever the price, two or three dollars plus the credit card fees, and you could print the document yourself. Um, so and, that and does, is another. Piece does the hundred? Does the hundred ninety thousand finish everything that you have, or is it just for? Oh no, it go, just goes back to nineteen seventy. So, um, it, you know, at least if we did that, that would. Um, bring us parallel with uh, most of the other towns in the area, you know, they have a lot, if not all of their land records available online and we only go back to 1991. Um, but there was a gap and we got that gap closed so I was grateful for that. Um, and now so, it just would be helpful if people could do the full 50 year search without coming into the office. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for Sue? Okay, so. All there. right, then uh, we have social and use services and park and rec social and use services is on page 58 and your hostess shall be Miss Erica. Thank you, Sue. Not like you're going anywhere. <laughs> no, thank you all very much. Good evening. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. All right, wonderful. Um, so good evening, Mayor, Deputy Mayor, Town Council members, and Town Manager. Um, I will be presenting on the social um, and youth service budget tonight. So I'm just gonna go through some of the highlights of the proposed budget. Please let me know as I go through if you have any questions and uh, myself or Kathy can um, help answer those. So first you'll see um, salaries and benefits. So these are just numbers that we've gotten from finance. Um, and contractual obligations. Next, you'll see travel training and dues, and you will see that there are some town manager reductions here. Um, we're just gonna keep an eye on that as the fiscal year starts and see how it plays out. Um, next, we have professional services, which consists of our senior citizen lunch program and our dial -a ride program, which is a senior and disabled transportation service. Um, I just wanna make note on that line item with the dial -a ride that ARPA funds were used um, for this current budget year. So in the upcoming proposed budget, we had to put back in the $120,000. Um, and also just this week, the dial -a ride company informed us that they will not be able to renew the contract for this upcoming year starting July. And the company stated this is because of high fuel prices, mandated uh, wage increases, and all the costs associated with providing transportation in this current economic environment. Um, myself and Kathy were able to have a conversation today with the vice president of the company and discuss potential options. Um, we also explained that this late of a notice has put us in a very difficult position for July 1st and discussed ways to possibly continue the service um, until we secure a new company. So just wanted to give that update. Um, next, we have support services. Um, you will see a town manager reduction here as well. Um, these proposed reductions will reduce clinical supports for residents as well as reduce after school positive youth development programs. Um, this, this line item um, tip, uh, typically helps defray the cost of youth programming, making it more manageable for families. Um, next, we have public contributions. You will also see a reduction in this category. Um, what that will mean is reducing, reducing um, financial support to local nonprofits that work with Weathersfield residents um, around crisis needs. Um, that our department uses um, these critical resources for issues such as mental health, behavioral health, domestic violence, and substance use. And then after that, we go into the senior center um, and programs of the senior center. And in, in this proposed budget, we actually brought the funding back up to previous levels. We are open and increasing programs um, 
currently. So the senior citizens have been very vocal about getting back to normal now that the pandemic's over um, and they can't wait to get back to the center um, full time. Um, and lastly, we have office supplies. This was also reduced um, in the town manager's uh, proposal and um, we'll just have to monitor that closely throughout the year as July 1st um, begins. You want me to pause here for any questions or continue on? You can continue. Okay. So I just wanted to go into uh, two staff requests that we have um, for this upcoming budget year. The first is a reclassification of our social worker position to a social worker two. Um, we just wanna highlight that this position has changed in our department. Responsibilities have increased due to the changing needs of our community. Um, some of those changes include our juvenile review board has increased, which is a diversion program for youth and their families um, that are experiencing at-risk behaviors, um, arrestable offenses, and um, behavioral and mental health needs. Um, the social worker is also a critical member of the town crisis intervention team and is our certified crisis intervention specialist, um, which means that she went through a rigorous training um, to be the specialist that responds through our department. Um, the social worker responds to community um, crisis situations, partners with the police department and also other community providers. Um, also, the social worker is in charge of all food bank operations and many new initiatives have been developed um, to respond to basic needs um, with targeted programs across all populations. And we've also recently, um, with the social worker, developed social media platforms to outreach to residents in need, as well as educating the community on needed donations. Um, I'm just gonna continue on. So the next position um, would be a request to increase the hours for our senior center coordinator. So we'll be going from currently, the senior center coordinator works 30 hours and would be going to 37.5 hours a week. Um, the senior citizens have continued to request the need to have the coordinator um, avail available to them um, and would like it uh, the coordinator available even more so. Um, membership programs and services continue to increase. Uh, seniors would like to see a variety of different programs and activities, um, including some that are offered in surrounding towns. They would like those available throughout the whole week. And um, seniors have um, really taken to utilizing the coordinator to navigate resources and refer them to appropriate organizations, as well as other departments within town hall. Would you like me to pause here or continue to go on to CNEF? Any questions for Erica up to now? I, I just have a quick okay. question. How many people use the Dial-A-Ride? So currently we have a membership of roughly 200. So what that, what that would mean is that they're registered members and they can utilize the service as many times as they would mm -hmm. like. There's no limit on it. Um, this is a lower number than in the past, but that it has been the trend throughout COVID. Um, just because people were not going to social events, they weren't opened as much, and some recreational, as well as putting off some medical appointments. So in a typical year prior to COVID, we would see up to closer to 300 members. Mm. Okay. I mean, I, I know it's, it's an important service for those who use it, but I'm... So the amount that you have budgeted in here for 120,000 is actually, if we were to renew it, it's going to be more than that because the current contractor said they can't do it for that amount. Is that correct? Um, so somewhat correct. So they were saying that they wouldn't be able to renew the contract because of the cost. I'm not sure if they would even, we're in, we're, we started the discussions with them to see okay. if there's anything that can be done. Um, but ultimately they might not be able to meet those requirements, no matter you know what the negotiation is on the, the financial piece. So we right. would have to go through a process of finding a new transportation service. I had suggested 
that um, <clears throat> depending well, depending on negotiations, it start get ready to go out for an RFP, <clears throat> so we can see who else is out there. Yes. And and we would also look at we would also look at what what was in the previous RFP and maybe make some changes to the type of services we offered to again try and stay within the budget if that was at all possible. So there's a lot of things we have to look at. We right now are budgeted for a thousand rides a month for 12, um, for the 12 months, so 12,000 rides a year. So we would look at all of that to see, can we re reduce it? Has our history shown that we could reduce that? And also we would look at all the places that we do go and the times that we go, and maybe there's a way to do some economy of of combining things. So we have a little bit to look at now. And um, these are the, usually the negotiations we would have done with Curtin as we looked for the renewal of the next year. So now we're going to look at all of that as part of the process. All right. Thanks. Problem. We would just have to be mindful, you know, like we saw on other budgets, uh, department budgets, you know, they would probably add, do they add in fuel cost or is it all just part of the budget for dial a ride? For dial a ride, I think it's it's all in the budget. That's all yeah. it turns yeah. out. They, yeah. they may look at, you know, increasing the budget because of fuel cost. And do they, can they, I guess, couple rides to Kathy's point, if you're looking at uh, um, some savings, would we be able to, you know, put multiple riders in one vehicle? Do we do that? That happens now with a lot of the common places that they go to. Uh, the community center is a good example when they play bingo and cards. There's generally, you know, you make one loop around town, pick everybody up, go to the community center. When it's over, it's kind of the same thing the other way. Gotcha. Okay. I think the other issue is lack, they can't find drivers, yep. just right. like the schools can't. Right. Yeah, we're in a challenging year to look at doing this, so. Just a quick follow-up, if I may, on the dial ride. Is the demand, Erica and Kathy, still pretty high in terms of ridership? So, we have the right the membership is down which has been down through covid um i think it's just because of the nature of the pandemic um i i believe that the need is there and the the residents that utilize dial a ride it really is truly sometimes their only option to get to some of the basic needs such as medical appointments and you know socialization programs and you know like our our senior lunch program at the community center got it thank you Any other questions? Well, got them. Um, Erica, did you have to see any up and uh, did you want to talk a little about the three year social police position, the clinical? Sure, I can talk about that in like the CNEF. Um, so on page 80, um, you'll see that there's an ARPA request for training for community and social services for $30,000. Originally, um, the, the new chief of the PD, we had um, kind of collaborated on this idea to look at using funding to possibly get a um, full-time clinical staff to work with the police department and um, social services as well. And um, we, with that, we had included some money for training so that we could um, have uh, offerings for both staff and community-wide trainings on um, some really critical topics that the chief and I both thought were pretty important, such as active shooter training, stop the bleed, Narcan, mental health first aid. Those are just a few of them. So we did put in for the funding for the full-time clinical as well as the training. And I believe only the 30,000, right? Correct, Bonnie, is the only thing in right now in that? Correct. Okay. Any questions on that? 
No, but I did see in the police budget, if I go back, uh, where is, what number is the police? Page 35. They had an increase for mental health, which I think it uh, state mandated mental health wellness checks. 20. Uh, my son turned off the light. <laughs> I was going to say, did you not pay the electric bill there? <laughs> I guess it's just habit for when my son grabs stuff off the printer to turn off the office light. Um, yeah, state mandated mental health wellness checks. This was something that was in was in the news lately. Uh, police departments are um, increasingly dealing with um, you know uh, residents with mental health issues. Would this thirty thousand dollars? <laughs> go towards some similar something similar to that um i'm not uh, exactly sure what that what they had in their budget for the pd that you're re that that's regarding to but uh, the training would try to go um to meet the needs of like the staff and kind of bring them up to date on some critical issues as well as community training um so i'm not exactly sure but i'm sure they'd we'd coincide on some things and definitely partner as best as we can yeah, because the police have 5,500 included in their budget for state mandated mental health wellness checks. Okay. So that could be something that we could utilize some of that 30,000 for. Sure, sure, yeah. Um, we can definitely discuss that further. Okay. They were talking today at the statewide managers luncheon about how <coughs> closing all these group homes is just really killing us all the towns you know with the demands on the police and sure. social services and the list just goes on and on and everybody said it's only going to get worse and somebody yeah. has to start addressing it on a statewide basis yeah they need to fund some of these mandates as well on the yeah absolutely yep. any other questions for eric on the team and we go to public or uh, we still, rec, so before we go age be 63 before we change over to that we just had two capital improvement items for social services oh, okay. oh that's right yep yeah, so I'll just go over those quick. I won't keep you guys any longer on my behalf, but um, on page 81 for capital request, um, ranking number 30 for ADA curbing for 25,000. Um, during the pandemic, we have been utilizing the front of the building for residents to access their food bank pickups, um, as well as for donations, since our donations have increased, which is a great, a, a great thing to have. Um, and we've we've noticed that it's been very beneficial, especially for residents who are, are senior citizens or disabled to access through that um, through the front of the building. So we've continued it, and it's and it's been very accommodating. Um, I know, I don't know if Kathy can speak a little more towards this, but there's some curving issues um, that make it a little difficult when we use care, um, shopping carriages to take in some of those donations or when people with, that have um, disabilities are walking up towards the building. And we were just looking to get that, um, to make that more accessible. Kathy, did you have anything you wanted to add? Yeah, we pretty much wore it out through COVID going in and out all the time with the carts and some of it needs to be refurbished and some of it needs to just be redesigned a little bit to make it a lot easier to get in and out of the curbing that's down there. And this is at the circle part? Yes, where the flagpole is. Yep. yep. Okay. It really came in very handy. And actually we're gonna look to continue it because it's, it's worked out very well for both the donations coming in and the food going out. And it's also kept better with uh, confidentiality and privacy for the people using it. They're not carting a shopping cart through the whole town hall. 
Right. Mm -hmm. And in years past, if I remember, there was talk about some type of overhang. <laughs> yeah, that got cut from the ARPA <laughs> list. <laughs> we tried for that too. Okay. Yep. Kathy, there is somewhat of a ramp there. It's just it's there, not there, straight. Is that what it is? There is a ramp, and if you go see it, it it's not a straight path from the door to the um, to to the pavers that are on the the road. Yeah. So you have to go around a a, a curve a little bit. And like a was, U or something. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It wasn't designed for shopping carts. Because shopping carts want to okay. go straight. I did, I, did, I did walk by it and try to figure out what you were trying to accomplish, but it certainly looked odd the way it was built. So yeah, and part Thank of you. the part of the sidewalk pavers have um have sunk a little bit and so the the curbing sticks up, so it's like a, a trip hazard, if you can visualize that. It just needs some work. And would uh, physical services be able to do that? That's very possible. We were talking with the town engineer just about kind of our ideas and what we were looking at, and it seemed to be not a, not a difficult fix but the materials would cost money. Okay. Anybody Mike? else? Oh, Mike, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Okay. No, I'm good. I wasn't sure if you could hear me. Okay. And then I just have one other one on the ranking number 43 on page 81 as well for our food bank for $30,000. I think I've mentioned already that our food bank operations have grown during the pandemic because of the need that's grown and also people it's brought awareness to, um, you know, food is, is, is really something that is needed for many in town given the crisis of um, the pandemic. So our food bank operations have increased in the donations as well, which makes um, space and town hall very difficult. I know many of you have seen the food bank. Um, we're in the lower level here and we're just running out of space. So we're looking to um, kind of strategize and reorganize some areas um, to better utilize storage space with some improvements. So that's what that, um, that funding would go towards. Should have hit the governor up yesterday. <laughs> I know, I didn't know where to go with it, but I should have. Okay. They wouldn't let me go to the, to the uh, meeting because they're afraid I was gonna ask them for money. <laughs> <laughs> it's always a good thing to keep asking. I don't know, a new DOT garage on Keisha Farm could be, uh, you know, get the plow trucks in, out, small little salt shed, get pilot money off of it. <clears throat> okay. All right. Well, thank you for the time this evening. Thanks. Thanks, Erica. Thank you. Yep. Park and Rec 63. Kathy, you're up. All righty. On the park and rec budget, just starting with the salaries, they're pretty much contractual, as you know. And I would just draw your attention to our part-time staff, because on that line item, in this year's current budget, it'll show $136,000. And then in next year's budget request, it jumps up to the $268,000. And in this year's budget, there's $157,000 that came out of ARPA, ARPA that is being used for our part-time budget this year. So that's why the number jumps. Um, the number jumps up, but also that's where we had to take some cuts for um, with the uh, manager's budget. And what I'd like to draw, uh, bring it to your attention is, probably one of the key cuts that we had to make in our part-time salary 
was uh, to get to this number was the indoor pool at the high school. Uh, we operate the indoor pool from generally October through early June. And we do both recreational swimming. We have the Barracuda swim team. And we also have the swim lessons on Saturday. So we had to cut the recreational swimming out of this budget to the tune of $36,000. But we kept the swim lessons in because they're extremely important, particularly with COVID. And kids couldn't get lessons for a couple of years. So we did that. And um, also the Barracuda swim team, that's a, a self-sustaining program. So that will be able to run also. So Barracudas will run, the swim lessons will run, but in this budget, uh, the cut is in the part-time staff. The big cut there is for the indoor pool staff for recreational swimming. That's both the early morning swim, the evening swim, and then the Saturday afternoon swim. So I just wanted to bring that to your attention. And uh, also... Uh, well, no, go right ahead. I'm sorry, I don't want to cut you off. No, no, I was just going to say we also cut a little money out of our special our special events for staff for some of our little programs like Halloween, the egg hunt, some of those kinds of things. We've, we've reduced those and we're going to try and be creative and find ways that we could still do those programs, but look at different ways of paying for staff. We just need additional staff besides the full-time staff to run those programs. Okay. Is there, Kathy, is there a revenue for the recreational swimming? There is. To uh, participate? Yes, we, we generally, um, coming out of COVID for next year, we estimated the indoor pool, if everything was running, would bring in about $10,000. Um, if we were to cut the indoor pool for recreational swimming, we figure that would be about a $5,000 revenue cut. The other $5,000 would come in with the swim lessons that we would have at the pool. Okay. So uh, it's not, not a situation where you could raise the price of recreational swimming to make it work? I don't think we could certainly raise the price. I don't know that we could raise it enough to make up the whole $36,000 because of it, there's people would either buy the daily, generally they buy the pool pass for the indoor season. And that's um, currently would be 60. If we ran the indoor season, it would be $65 or daily admission. Then if they came just whenever they wanted to, that's a different fee. Okay. We could get some potentially. I don't think we could get it all in one year. I was trying to relate it to the Barracudas, which you said funded itself. So is that is that program very expensive for the swim team to practice or? Um, gosh, I'd have to look that fee up. I want to think it's around a um, hundred. Oh, 300, I've got um, about $300 for the season. And that, that, pays. Kind of answers, that answers my question. Yeah. You'd have to, you'd have to raise the, the recreational swim to, you know, three or four times what they're paying now. No one's going to do that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And just one more thing to bring to your attention with the part-time staff is that as you're aware, the minimum wage has been going up the past couple of years, a dollar a year. And in this upcoming fiscal year on July 1, it goes up to $14 an hour. And then in the same fiscal year on June 1st, it goes up to $15 an hour. So we get a, a double whammy at both ends of our budget. So that's we did not increase any staffing, any programs in the operating budget. The increase is strictly due to the minimum wage going up. And when we, and we looked at all that when we did this budget that there are no new initiatives. We're just kind of maintaining what we've got and um, still took the cuts, which obviously, uh, you know, it breaks my heart to close the indoor pool for rec swimming. But 
but in Parks and Rec, when we go through our budget, you're going to see there's very few other places to go except our part-time staff, which runs our programs. Do, so, do we have we have part-time staff that like is currently making say fourteen dollars an hour? So when the uh, the lower paid people get bumped up, do we have to bump other people higher up? You know, like, it is it. Uh, it is a domino effect because the people we have supervising the $14 an hour people can't be making 14 and 25. Right. It, it, that just doesn't work, particularly <laughs> on the lifeguard side, because we're always in competition with our, our neighboring towns, uh, trying to uh, keep everybody that we train in, in town, we try to keep them for parks and rec, but they get the training and go different places. Thank you. So then when you look at the rest of the park and rec budget, and I'll go through this quickly and just highlight a couple of key things. And then if you have questions, I'd be happy to talk about them. Uh, the rest of the budget, you'll see a lot of um, town manager cuts in materials, supplies, our repair accounts, and our accounts that support programs. So if I were to just kind of do a quick pass through travel training and dues, we held that the same because we cut it last year or the current year we're in. Um, support services, we took out um, any new initiatives we had in there and we reduced some of our things and are gonna try and figure out other ways to be creative with making some of this stuff up. Um, that then brings you into all the utilities, which I'm sure you've already talked about. Uh, we then get to our, um, our rentals and facilities. And I would I draw your attention to, we're gonna be reducing some of our bus, bus rental costs and our, our, our transportation costs for some of our adult programs and our Camp Sunrise program that we transport uh, children with special needs to a, um, uh, a regional camp in Glastonbury. But uh, one topic that um, has come up over the past couple of years is our uh, portalettes in all the different parks and facili uh, outdoor facilities that we have. And even though we, we go through the uh, CROG, bill, big, CROG bid and use that and work with our vendor, those prices go up both for the monthly rentals and for the cleaning. And this year they instituted, it's a $25 charge to drop it off and a $25 charge to pick it up at the end of the season. And if it falls down during the season, there's a charge to come out and clean it. And the kids seem to like it's a game they play to knock these over. So we had originally gone up on that from 6,000 to 8,000 and we dropped it back to 6,000. That's gonna be an issue. And, and we've had discussion with that with the park board as to how we're gonna look to pay for all these portalettes. The other um, cuts are all, you can see they're all cuts to different supply materials, repair accounts. So we'll just be hoping that things go well in our repair accounts and things, um, we'll just work with what we've got in all the other budgets. And I'd be happy to answer questions on the park and rec budget itself. Just going back to the, um pool it's open october to june early june like that very first week in june could we just decrease the months to you know would that save without completely eliminating it go you know november 1 to march 1 or something like that would we certainly could we'd take whatever we could get absolutely and then the second question on that would be, have we seen a increase, decrease, or static on usage of that? It's, it's really difficult with COVID because we, we just opened it this year. Um, it, it was always holding steady. We'd, it, it would always go up a little, go down a little, but it was a real steady, good clientele. We used to have families that would come out on Friday night. So it was a, I'd probably say if, if I had to say in a normal situation, it remained a little static. 
Swim lessons are extremely popular in the school year. That's why we had to we got to keep those. Mm -hmm. Without a doubt, uh, it's a safety issue too. Yeah. Um, and then the the big driver on that is thirteen to fourteen dollars an hour, fourteen to fifteen dollars an hour. Yes. How many staff yeah. do we have uh, that man the the pools are these the lifeguards or these it's strictly we hire all lifeguards so that in case because we have to have a minimum of um two lifeguards um a director and then a fourth uh what we call a, a fourth lifeguard that checks people in as they're coming in to make sure they pay or that they have um their pool pass and so, and that fourth pit person gives us, in case somebody calls out sick, we still have the minimum of three that we need absolutely to open that pool. And so and we, we hire all lifeguards. And we have enough staff for that? Enough lifeguard staff? We think so. I mean, we've been pretty good with um, our lifeguard staff in the, in the school year because we do all the training in the summer and we always hire always some new people in the summer and we we hope to carry them over into the school year um i had a question about a program the governor had done last summer and then i believe he just announced it just recently the summer enrichment program mm -hmm. has the town taken advantage of that We've looked into it and some of the criteria that we have doesn't match with what we do. And some of it would be more costly for us to do. So we're looking at it again this year to see if things have changed. We did look at it last year and um, there's a lot of criteria associated with it that some of the bigger cities can handle pretty easily. But for us, it's, it's, it's additional costs. Mm -hmm. for what we would do but this we year, look at it every year yeah this year there is a last year there was no match this year for municipalities there's a 50 got to read it correctly but it looks like a 50 percent match so if you're looking to get a hundred thousand dollars or whatever and we didn't take advantage of it last year but if you were going to take advantage of it this year to get a hundred thousand we would have to put up 50 and then the state would put up the additional 50. I did not get that far in it this year. So that would be difficult for us. Yes, but it's a good program if, if there were no strings attached. I would agree with you. And we, we looked at it very carefully last year thinking the Nature Center is really the closest program we have that would get close to the hours and close to other things. But then there were other things that were required that we don't do. Gotcha. I did forget to mention one other cut that um, has been a request now for two years from our Veterans Commission for um, $1,500 to do some of their activities. And, and mostly they wanna do some mailings to, um, to people. And, and Mary could speak a little more to that. She is the staff person with our Veterans Commission. And, um, They've been looking just to, to get some additional resources to get uh, information out to veterans in the community. They've instituted a newsletter that they've done twice. We have another one that's getting ready to go out um, next month. And that uh, all these things are expensive to mail out. Additionally, they're looking to try to create some more outreach programs to reach the veterans in town, including an informational briefing. We've had some really great speakers come to the Veterans Commission and the commissioners are all like, why aren't we telling this to the people of the town, the, the veterans in town, instead of a group of people who kind of know it all already. So they would love to try to do that. That's something that we are looking to try to do this fall or late summer, um, but you know, they'd like to have refreshments. They'd like to do various different things and all of these things uh, cost money and they are 100% funded by donations at this time. We were very lucky to get some pretty significant donations a couple of years, 
about a year and a half ago, year, two years ago. And then some of our commissioners have continued to make donations to their, their own commission uh, to make sure that we can at least continue our newsletter, if not um, increase some of the initiatives that they have through their planning process. We also do have a, um, a whole um, planning meeting set up where they're gonna be setting goals for the next couple of years. That's coming up at the end of the month. Um, so, you know, any funding that they get, you know, they would be looking to put that to good use. Could we look to capture email addresses and do a digital newsletter? We have the only, the way that we get our uh, addresses is we get a, an output from the uh, assessor's office for the individuals who are using the veterans associated Exemption. Yes. So that's a, a great number of people. When the Veterans Commission did do their needs assessment survey, they did ask for uh, email addresses, but I, it, it, comparatively, it's a handful because I do the newsletter and I mail it to every all of those that I have, but I also email it to any email addresses that I have. Uh, it's just like I said, comparatively, it, it's a handful. Um, okay. Yeah. Mary, um, I'll just say one of the reasons we started the Veterans Commission was to make sure our veterans knew about the services uh, that were offered and how to get access to them. Um, right now, I know Chris Taylor and, and you and, and the group does as much outreach as you can. With this $1,500, do you think you can reach that much more or that many more veterans with, the, again, the goal of making sure they know of the services that they can get? I think they're, they're hoping that that would be the, the key, not only because we'd be able to continue the newsletter at least twice, maybe three times a year, but also to hold veterans <laughs> information briefings at the community center and, you know, bring in the, the, uh, the publicity we can get through Amy and the senior center. Um, do it at a certain time of day, so it'd be after work, but before it's dark so that we get the working veterans, but it's not dark so we don't get the older veterans. There's just a whole lot that we talk about in our meetings to try to um, increase the reach because that is one of their goals is to try to reach all veterans in Weathersfield. So, they, I mean, the hope is by with the funding, they'll be able to do additional initiatives to, and, to reach more people. And Mary, you, you may not know these numbers, but do you know offhand how many veterans we have in Wethersfield? And this will be a, a more tougher question. How many of them to access some of these benefits? I, I apologize. I am, okay. I do not have that number. Maybe we can get that from Chris Taylor. Bonnie, is that possible or Mary? No, but I bet you there, I bet you can get it through the state. I'll put it on my list of things to look. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Mary. You're welcome. Kathy, you wanna keep going? Sure. Um, so that's, that's the park and rec budget. I do have a reclassification request in for our rec supervisor one to go to a recreation supervisor two, the job responsibilities have changed because we've done a lot more with technology than we ever had in the past. And the rec supervisor one has shown an affinity for all this work with our technology and our software and has done a lot of the behind the scenes work as we've brought in different software packages to use within our department. So this has uh, now become a big part of what is done in the job. And she's our lead person on our technology platforms, not only bringing in our software, she also now is, trains our staff on using the software and also keeps us moving forward. I'm ready to say, isn't this enough? And she said, we've got the next, next package. And as an example, we currently have the registration software and we do the credit cards, we've brought in all those pieces and uh, we do memberships now with our nature center. We're gonna do memberships with the senior center 
and um, we do memberships with our pool passes. And the pool passes have now gone to where they're the, you actually can, um, can use your phone to get into the pool now if you bought your pool pass. So all of that technology takes a, takes a person that needs to understand how to make that work in the system. So that's a big part of how some of the job responsibilities have changed. And we also, we brought in just last year with COVID, we brought in the facility management package that we put all the athletic fields in and we're using that. And then the next step will be all the community center rentals, all of the Salmon Wells house rentals. Uh, we'll rent anything we have and we're renting out the picnic pavilion. We have a variety of things and that's our next step to, um, to really make us all digital. And this position has really taken the forefront to bring us into that and to get the necessary training from the software company to understand how to use the software. So that's one piece of the, of, of the request for the reclassification. And the other piece is person is also out in the field and assists with the uh, operations of some of our facilities, for instance, the Cove Marina, our aquatics pools, playgrounds, our tennis and basketball courts, where they actually get out there, they inspect, they supervise, makes recommendations for uh, future improvements. And um, all of that piece comes together. And those are new additions to what the rec supervisor job description is today. So that's a request we're looking for a reclassification on that. And that's not too costly, if I'm not mistaken. No, that's just, um, it's just a, uh, a grade change. Uh, yeah, it's to the grade change, it's $843 for next year. Got it. Um, speaking of the moorings in Weathersfield Co. Uh, how are we doing with that? Are, are we seeing an increase, decrease? Because oh, that's we, a revenue generator for us, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, and those funds go into the Cove Preservation Fund. And um, the moorings, um, I would tell you the first and second year of COVID, they went up just because everybody bought a boat to be outside and on the water. Um, and now some of my park board members who own boats say it may go down a little because of the fuel costs. So that's something we have to watch and see. We've sold some moorings already. People start thinking about there are some, some people start buying them in January and then they really pick up uh, May. We open at the Memorial Day and then into June. So we generally stay around an average of 20 to 25 moorings. So that's about an average of what we do. So okay. we, we're gonna, and we, we do sell a lot of season passes. So that also brings in some good revenue. You need good boating weather and it has, it's always better when the fuel costs aren't quite as high. Would this bump up from rec supervisor one to rec supervisor two, if, did I hear you correctly? They would actually be working to see if we could generate more revenue through the parks and rec? Oh, we always do that anyways. <laughs> All the staff do that. As a matter of fact, we, we've had discussions prior to the start of this budget year that we need to look at ways to bring in revenue. We have to be careful with fees because we're coming out of COVID. So there's a, there's a balance there. And um, because we do need to, we're, our goal is to get back to the revenue we were giving to the general fund prior to uh, COVID and COVID just took a, a big cut out of it for the time being. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions for Kathy and her team? I would just talk about our capital improvements. And I'm, I, I'm not sure if you received the um, I, I did a capital improvement sheet that um, identified the CIAC rankings along with what the park board priorities were. Yes, Kathy, they have it. Okay. Um, 
And I could just go down this quickly if you have that, or and I can also reference it's on page 81, the regular CIAC report that you have. Mm -hmm. So um, so all I did was give you park board priorities on that sheet and also what the CIAC ranking was. And just to go down it very quickly, and I'll start with the community center, the HVA system, HVAC system for the banquet room. That's critical, that unit, unit that can fail at any time. And our repair account, we have to hold on to most of that money for the spring when the air conditioning comes on because there are always problems with it. Um, and um, we've already gone out and gotten the engineering design and that's where we got the opinion of probable cost. So um, that was our park board priority number one and the CIAC ranking was number seven. So that, that is critical to the operation of the banquet room and our ability to rent out that facility. Okay. Um, the other, the nature center, the sidewalk in front of the main entrance and the ramp just need work. Um, physical services has identified the Millwoods Park filter tanks. That's number, um, the nature center was item 10 on the CIC ranking and the filter tanks were item 13. Um, Salmon Wells House Repairs, that's to do exterior repairs at the house. That was the CIAC ranking of 25. The Millwoods parking lot was the CIC ranking of 34. And the Community Center parking lot repairs, um, that ranking was number 35. And um, the other thing, the one other thing, I guess I got to bring up two other things. I had, uh, with the park board, we had submitted, when we were talking about the ARPA funds, all the tennis, basketball and tennis court resurfacing as one package that shows up on my sheet as 440,000 and it's number 37 on the CIAC ranking. And I wanna bring to your attention the Millwoods tennis courts, which were one of our priorities for this upcoming year to, basically go in and resurface them. There are a lot of cracks on them. And we had gotten an estimate in the fall of $68,000 for that. And I had gotten a call this week that the courts were in bad shape and there were holes on them. So I went out to look at them and something happened over the winter. We're gonna have to have somebody come out and look at them. The, um, uh, the north side of the courts that are kind of adjacent, uh, adjacent to the church at the back fence along the back end line there of the uh, courts all of a sudden have started to undulate and they look like a wave with some actual tiny little potholes that if you put your foot in it, it will present a safety hazard i just saw this today and i have to talk with maintenance about it uh, to see if we can at least fill the holes and look at it but that, if I, I, if we, we're going to have to do something to fix those, or if that gets worse, we're going to have to close those courts. And I just noticed that today. I didn't realize something went on over the winter because these, this was not obvious at all in the fall when we brought a contractor out to give us a price. So I just bring that to your attention now that that one would also be critical to us at 68,000 to at least get a start to understand what's going on out there and identify what we're gonna need to do. And I, that, I just- Is that part of the 440,000? It six? is, yeah. Okay. All those numbers add up to the 440,000. All the uh, courts that we identify. On my little white, I don't know if you have the little white sheet. Yep, oh, mm -hmm. I don't know, that may be on my- uh, in the emails, but yep. uh, um, yeah, it uh, would be part of that 440. Does the park and rec utilize the tennis courts at the high school? Uh, no, we par well, when you say parks and rec, we will do our we do our tennis lessons we, in the summer at Millwoods and we use web, but the high school courts are, are available to the public and they're they're used a lot in the summer because I go up there during the summer 
and we have a lot of a lot of groups that have their own time that they go, whether it's morning, afternoon, or evening. So, worst case scenario, would we be able to close Millwood's tennis courts for any type of repairs that need to be done, and send people up to the high school? Yes, the high school with the eight courts. They just don't have the lights, and the Millwood's tennis courts have the lights. Okay. I have a quick question about those tennis courts. Um, if you, if we were to give you the funding for the Millwood's resurfacing of the courts, could they be done before the summer season? We could certainly call the contractor and find out what their schedule is. Um, right, right now, we only know of one company in Connecticut that actually does the tennis court repairs. So we think we found another one. So we'd, we'd have to go out for a quick uh, to get a, a, a quote or a bid for that and see if they could fit us in their schedule. And it's possible. Except okay. don't forget the, the, the money for the courts. If, if you put it in the budget, it's not effective till July 1. Oh, right. So yeah, but isn't, isn't, that in, isn't that in capital? Yeah, it's in the ARPA funds. So it's in the ARPA funds. It's not. Oh, yeah. You could use oh. it whenever. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. All right. I forgot about that. Yeah. Well, that's even the other, better. The other thing I wanted to mention about the tennis courts, I had a conversation with Kathy. The the repairs only last five, five or six years. Is that correct, Kathy? Yeah, it depends on. Um, usually, they say when you resurface a court, you should do it every five to six years. Hmm. And we have a we have a pattern that we've been keeping with, and every year the CIAC would generally give us money to do a to do a facility, and we've we've kept on a nice schedule with that. And Mill Woods would have been up for was coming up for this this year. Okay. Something crazy went on over the winter that I'm going to ask maintenance if they. Somebody mentioned it. It looked like a frost heave. Yeah water got under and froze and expanded. Uh, the park on Cedar Street, would that be included in the resurfacing? Are there any improvements that are going on at that? I think it's got basketball court and maybe, you know, a, a jungle gym or something like that. Yep, we call it, yep, Cedar Street. It's called the Cedar Street Playground or Farms Village. It, it has that name too. And that was part of that basketball tennis court resurfacing. All that was uh, to do the basketball there to resurface that was 20,000. Is that utilized? I, I think I've heard from the neighbors that more kids are moving into the, that have moved into the neighborhood. That was what they were, when they moved in, they, they lobbied and got money for the new pl the playscape that's there on Cedar Street. So that was about uh, four years ago. So probably they're now getting older for the basketball court. Gotcha. Okay. And then there was, um, just to bring up, I I'd like to make a, a special plea for the high school softball field to do some um, improvements up there. Uh, some of those players came to one of your council meetings and spoke at the council meeting. They're looking to get some improvements so that they could have electricity at the field for a scoreboard and for a PA system to make the announcements and also to plug in the pitching machine and also to look at um, some um, dugouts on either side of the field and a scoreboard. So yeah. we were we were we put in the twenty five thousand uh, that wouldn't cover it all, but we were looking for them to also fundraise. So that could be the town's match. So that was why that came up. OK. Yeah, I know the dugout. Somebody had mentioned the dugout. I just don't know how or, or not stands, but benches for fans to be able to watch on the third baseline. It's yep. But it's pretty tight there with the path and. Yeah, we thought we could fit a set of bleachers that could be used there in the spring and then also be used for the fall sports also and be moved back 
to there used to be a, a another separate stand of bleachers next to the um, stadium bleachers. So um, so you can now buy like I'll call them portable bleachers that are you can put wheels on them and just kind of move them over. So we were looking at all that and made a budget. And we did, the town engineer did do a design for us because we had to see if the dugouts would fit. And <coughs> um, we'd have to put a retaining wall on the third base side. Well, retaining wall is a little too, uh, but it's some, uh, a wall would have to go there to hold the hill. Right. But um, it's all part of the budget. The budget came out to be about $52,000 for everything that they wanted to do. So it wasn't an, an unreasonable cost. It just, it's hard to find all that money. Gotcha. That's and then, story. no, go yeah. ahead. No, that's, that's hard to find the money. <laughs> <laughs> I know that. That's why I told them we'd put together a budget, which we did. And we're, you know, we asked them to prioritize things to see what we could get done. And maybe they could start fundraising and we could. And they always point to the boys field, which has all those things, except the bleachers. Yep. Um, my last question would be on the Millwoods parking lot. What, what needs to be done there? That we'd like to put a parking lot adjacent to the tennis courts. It's kind of that area where everybody kind of drives off sort of behind the portalette, if you're familiar with the portalette that sits right there. Um, it would be a stone dust parking lot uh, only because uh, on busy days and nights and when there are big things going on in the park, there's just not enough parking in the park and they park all over the grass and everywhere. Oh, yeah. So this would be opposite. This would be closest to where the, the entry into the uh, uh, parking lot for classic field and the pool house. Yeah, it's near the bathhouse. Yes. Yep. Yep. No, I know everybody parks there. Yeah, they park there anyway, except there's one. I've been waiting for this one tree that's really pretty, and they've told me it's old and it should die. We don't want to cut it. So it's sort of in the middle of the parking lot. So I figured by the time I got the money, the tree would be ready to be gone. Mm. OK. And then there's item number 44 on your CIAC ranking for 404,000, which was, we looked at all our parks and just uh, with the park board, we came up with some multiple projects to look at when we were asked to look at all the ARPA projects. You're close to $2 million, Kathy. Yeah, and I, that doesn't include the community center if we did the whole building, that and Tom could speak to that if one point seven six million. <laughs> yep, I saw that earlier. I'm, I always like to be proactive because one of the things we always look at, we do a lot, we look at a lot of capital projects with all the parks and recreation facilities. And you never know when grants might become available. And the question they always ask is, is it in your 10-year capital improvement plan? So if I put everything in there, I can always say yes. I figured, okay. it, was worth, I figured it was worth getting it on the list. Sure. Anything else for Parks and Rec? Before we start to lose people. <laughs> All okay. right, then we have Mr. Eichner and Mr. Uh, Kelleher, uh, Town Live Radio, page 40. Thanks, Kathy, Erica. Thank, and, uh, thank you, everybody. Mary. Thank you very much. John? Thank you, Bonnie. Um, yeah, Bob was with us, uh, but he's, he's actually working up at Bradley tonight. I think he's on the, he may be on the phone now. He's, he's, he's out. Yeah, he is. He is. Yeah. Um, I'll try to make I apologize this... about the noise. <laughs> oh, there you are. Yep. Uh, townwide radio budget. The first thing, there's several fairly significant changes in the uh, line items that you'll, you'll see. The first obviously is uh, the addition of a part-time employee and that's 
uh, Bob will be Bob Kelleher to take over my responsibilities. Uh, so that's the first item in the salary and, wa and wages line item where there had been nothing. I'm a contract employee, so I'm out of the uh, consultant line. Uh, so that's that's for Bob to, to start uh, doing radio stuff uh, as of July 1st. Uh, correspondingly, the professional services account is reduced from 60 to 40. I, I've budgeted myself for a uh, half a year at my current rate of you know, about 20 to 24 hours a week, and then $10,000 for anything after July 1st, uh, so that I'd be on call for Bob if he needs any assistance in anything. Um, probably some help putting the budget together next spring, uh, but yeah. that kind of phases me out over the next 12 months. Um, you know, my day-to-day -day work would end December 31st, but I'd be around for it six months thereafter if available or if needed. There are a couple increases in the uh, support services line items. The Harris maintenance contract, and that's, that's set by contract, uh, the contract that was signed seven, eight years ago, that has an annual escalation. The second item in there for software FX and sums maintenance, we had been doing just sums. Software FX is a new software charge of about $80,000 a year that picks up, um, actually it picks up uh, on the fifth anniversary, again, per contract. That service was available, included in the original purchase price through the first five years after system acceptance. We accepted the system April 18th, 2017. So that's actually picking up uh, as of this week, we need to be paying for uh, software FX. Um, I did not budget anything for the first, last couple of months this year, but I think I can probably <coughs> scratch it up if they send me a bill. If not, I'm going to beg off and say, can we just have that kick in July 1st? But that's an additional charge per the contract that was signed years ago. Beyond that, uh, things pretty much remain the same for the um, shelter leases, uh, uh, repair and maintenance of equipment, um, rentals, uh, and my specialized agency supplies. I guess I'll take a pause at that point and see if there are any questions on this portion of the budget. Uh, line item 53311, specialized agency supplies. Yep. Police and fire spare and replacement portable radios, 12,000. Increase? Yes. Um, we've uh, been getting more and more repairs. Um, I have only four spare portables in police right now. I'd like to have a few more in stock so that um, when we do send things out, you know, generally I have one to two to three units out at the repair shop at any given moment. Uh, as a period a while ago where I had six units out at the repair shop. I had to ship them to Lynchburg, Virginia, where they do the repairs and then it comes back. So they're gone for about a month. So I'd like to increase the spare inventory. It, we have about, about uh, 50 police portable radios. We should have by, by industry standards, a, a spare inventory of, of 10 to 15%. Um, so that would give us five to seven. I've only got four. So that, that would help me get those spare inventory back up. Okay. Um, uh, next line underneath, town manager reduced by 3,000 mo mo uh, miscellaneous tower site spare boards and components. Yep. But it, only, it goes from 10 to four, not 10 to seven. Or is that... I think I probably put in for seven and it was you reduced put to in four. for seven and reduced to ten, uh, four. Yeah. I mean, what I'm doing there is I, every year I buy one or two uh, boards and components. This stuff is all under maintenance, but it's shipped to, uh, to Harris if, if something breaks down. I'm trying to develop a little bit of an inventory of uh, components like uh, transmit and receive modules that go into the, the uh, radio core system so that we have 
hot swappable units. We can pop one in and send it back out to get repaired and then bring it back in. So we had nothing to begin with. And, it, and for the last four or five years, I've been buying a couple of components every year. Um, you know, I, I can live with that cut. That's not going to kill me anyway. And then the next one, two control stations for neighboring town interoperations, I guess. Yeah, that's in the current year. We have 15,000. I haven't pulled the trigger on that yet. Um, I, I save all my major acquisitions like that for the fourth quarter in case something comes up that I need it. But I'm working on getting purchase orders cut for that and other items that I have in CNEF. Would we need 15,000 for that next year? We, uh, I don't have anything in for that next year. Okay. That's so we don't 15, 15 in the current year. Got it. So that'll stay zeroed out? Yep. Okay, just wanted to make sure. That's, that's for uh, Newington and Rocky Hill. Uh, we provided Rocky Hill with, a, with a, a control station for our system, but we don't have one for theirs. So this, this will get us a Rocky Hill control station and a Newington. So we'll be able to tie their systems into ours. And maybe to make it a little bit clearer, John, through this, could you tell us the needs and the wants? The needs and the wants. Well, the supplies, like, you know, the batteries, the, the miscellaneous supplies, antennas and charges, those are the top priority because I need those daily. I mean, I get people coming in looking for, they break a break a um, antenna or a battery. Uh, I buy holsters for the police officers. Um, uh, what else? Speaker mics. Um, so th those things are important to keep operating. So those would be the top priority. Um, portable, you know, the replacements. We'll get into a, a, another discussion as we get into the uh, CNEF stuff about uh, portables. And so, you know, those would be lower down on the, on the priority list. Okay, I'm just going through. Um... Bear with me. Mm -hmm. Electricity. They all stay the same. And the software FX, that is a need? Yes. Yes, that's by contract. Um, it's, a, it's a maintenance fee uh, that is part of our contract that we signed. And, and actually, they sent me a bill about two years ago to kick that in. Um, on five, the, the fifth year anniversary of the system installation, I looked at the contract and I says, no, 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 no. The language is clear. That kicks in five years after acceptance date. And we didn't accept for two years and four months after the installation. So I've kind of bought off on that charge for, by, by being able to read the contract uh, for Here's almost later. two and a half years. Yep. But that is a, a contractually required payment for software maintenance. And then the Harris maintenance contract that That's, goes up annually. Yes, there's an escalation. Um, I, I don't know if I gave it to you when we had our informal meeting, the, uh, the schedule of that there's a chart that that's scheduled out over the years. Uh, it's not it wasn't included in this package. But you should have that uh, chart from your notes from the, um, or no, oh no, wait a second, was that with, uh, it wasn't with you, that was with Bonnie. Okay. Uh, but I've, I've given that to you in the prior years. I can forward that through Bonnie to you if you want to see that. So I guess I'm wondering why in the Harris maintenance contract aren't some of the things like batteries, antennas, chargers, all that included in there? Uh, um, they're consumables, I guess, is by all I can answer to, to that question. Um, you know, that's not- what are we kind of like maintenance on anything that you buy. You might have a warranty, but you're gonna have to pay for the batteries and you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I guess, what are we getting for the 196,000 for the we're Harris? Get, we're getting da daily checks by the technician and one, at least once a week visit on site. That's Randy White, that's our technician paid by Harris. So he comes in, um, he does all the maintenance, you know, 
tests, everything. We had them in, uh, we had, we installed a UPS up at the uh, Callahan station about three weeks ago. And to install that, we had to shut the site down entirely for about four hours. Uh, when we powered it back up, one of the uh, components that was in there, one of our GPS satellite receivers didn't come back. Um, so that, you know, he had to take that out. He, he didn't have a spare. So th those are redundant. We have two of each of those at every site. So we, on a wing and a prayer, limped along with one for about 36 hours. But that's the sort of stuff that's covered under the maintenance. So that was shipped back and replaced by a new unit. Um, and that's part of that 180 some odd thousand dollars maintenance fee. Okay. Any questions for John? I think everybody's had it. <laughs> yeah, and I'm sorry. It, you know. No, no, it's not just you. It's just been a long week. Yeah. Um, on to the. Uh, CNEF, page 80. There are three items in there for the town-wide radio system. The first is portable replacements, XL400. About two and a half years ago, we heard that this radio, this is the lowercase radio for, for our parks and rec and, and um, uh, physical services users. We have about 80 of these. We heard that these radios were going to be end of life. So two years ago, I started a replacement getting six or 10 a year of the newer model, the, 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 low, the low end model of the XL line. You can see the difference between the, the XG and the XL. Public safety has all the XL 200s. They introduced uh, some XL 95s and 145s, which is a lower end for, for non-public safety users. So I started replacing those. Within the past year, Harris has introduced a new super fire rate. So the plan was to replace those 80 XG25s with lower end XL models, the new radio. Within the last year, Harris has introduced a new fire radio. It's the XG400. And you can see the difference. This is a standard public safety radio, police and fire. This is the new fire designed X. XL400. This is an XL200. This is an XL400. You can see it's thicker. It's taller. It's got a bigger antenna. Even from the, the, the top, you can see, I don't know if I, yeah, I mean, it's, bulk, it's a much bulkier radio. We want to buy about 12 of these this year since they're new. Have fire test them and, and see if they will work well for the fire service. If in fact they do like them and, and it works out well, this is actually a demo unit that was shipped to me. And, I, and the unfortunate thing is I wanted this to be, I would have loved for this to be in person so I could hand this around and pass the two radios to you. You All could right. feel the difference and look and touch them. But the bottom line here is if, if these are valuable to the fire service and they do a lot of things besides being bulkier, they, they meet all NFPA 1901 safety standards. Um, they have a special speaker mic, which wasn't available, that, that um, has volume control on the lapel, on the mic, which is not available now. Um, there's other safety features in this fire radio. If these fire radios turn out to be the right thing, rather than replacing the XG25's low end to low end, what we would like to do over the next couple of years is replace the fire radios with these and push those XG, XL 200s that fire is now using down to the lower, um, lower level users. So it's a change in strategy. So that's what that first item in there is the portable replacements XL 400P for fire. Um, we wanna get a couple of, at least one apparatus <laughs> and maybe some command staff equipped with that so they can give it a, a, a real good field test before we pull the trigger on that. Uh, the second item is uh, UPS and HVAC upgrades. I've done this over the last few years too. I've replaced uh, two shelter UPSs, which are end of life. 
Um, this year, in this current year's budget, I have the first of the shelter HVAC units, which are 20 years old and have given us maintenance problems, quite frankly. So a few years back, I started moving towards doing those one shelter per year. So that continues with that next item. And the last item there, the third one is the network century replacements. Uh, you recall when I talked to you a couple of weeks ago when we had the uh, system presentation that there are some components that are based on older computer technology. And these are the oldest ones, the network centuries, which are the devices in each radio shelter that captures alarms, uh, pulls the system for errors and, and notifies us if there's an issue. Uh, it also tells us, you know, if somebody enters the shelter, it, the door is opening, if the generator doesn't fire up. They're, they're very critical uh, components to the system. Those are, I think I mentioned to you that those were based on Windows 7 technology. Turns out I was wrong. They're based on Windows X, XP technology. That's the platform that's encoded into those uh, existing network entries. So those are the most vulnerable and oldest of the off the shelf components. And I wanna start replacing those. I'm not sure if $100,000, we have, again, uh, redundancy, two of them in each of the four shelters. So there's eight of them. I think I can get all eight done, but I'm not 100% sure, but um, $100,000 will go a long way to replacing those units. And that's it on the CNEF list. Um, and actually, there, there's nothing on the CIAC list. So questions on those CNEF? Any questions? Items? Okay. Would you would you like to see and touch and feel these two radios? Um, I can possibly bring one to the next council meeting. At the start of it, you can you know pass them around and, and compare them. Would that be helpful at all? I don't think so. I don't know. I'll leave it up to everybody. Yeah. I think you're. I think you're probably all set. It's okay. the public safety Trust. people that have to like it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Not you guys. Yeah, I, I mean, we've had this demo in for a couple okay. of days. Bob's been using it, um, and I asked him to give it to me so I could at least show it tonight. Um, you know, nice, yeah, nice colors, so they don't lose them, so they don't run them over by accident. Um, so we'll we'll get, you know, we'd like to get some of those in and and have fire test them out. Okay. No questions for John or Bob. Okay. I have um, suggested to the mayor, due to the lateness of the hour, we move finance over to the beginning of your next meeting, uh, which is Tuesday at six at the community center and we're feeding you. So that's my suggestion. I think everybody's about had it tonight, including me. <laughs> and then Bonnie, can you just go over those dates again? Sure. Um, next week it's... Um, Oops, wrong thing. Next week, it's Tuesday, and that's all we have is next Tuesday. And then the following week, we have just one. Let me get it. Uh, nope, nope, nope. I think it's Thursday. Yeah, May um, 5th at 6. I'm not sure of the room yet. The problem we're having is the Board of Ed and others are already have me, um, the Council Chambers. But Tuesday... Next week is definitely community center at six. Then the following week, we have the 10th at seven o'clock. And then right now, tentatively, we have budget adoption the Friday. Oh, great. Friday the 13th woo, at eight o'clock. Not eight o'clock p.m. No, 8, uh, 8 a.m. Well, yeah, that's just a placeholder for the start right, of the day right right right, right. yeah so that's what we've got are we so meeting that excuse me bonnie are we meeting on that friday at some point is that i think it depends on how well you do with the budgets how, okay. you know you know what you may have to add meetings you may be able to adopt earlier that's up to you so 5 26 6 o'clock 
Fireside. Yep. And we'll have something to eat. Five, five, six o'clock TBD. Five, ten, seven o'clock TBD. And possible adoption sometime on the 13th. Yep. We have anything else for tonight? No, not if you nope. want to move finance over till Tuesday. MDC, yeah. we have nothing to do. No, 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 no. There's nobody coming the... from MDC. That's that's set. Well, no, thank goodness. I saw it on the schedule. It said 915 MDC. That's why I was asking. No, 915 would be finance. Finance. Oh, and debt and all six, seven issues oh, MD... under oh, MDC is part of finance. Yeah, yeah, Mike. Mike would handle all seven of those. Mike, and you stayed late, and you're the best Mr. dressed Mr. guy Mr. here, Mike O'Neill. You got your suit on, and uh, I'm ready to go. Let's go. He waited all night. Uh, Sorry that you. Do you guys mind? Yeah. I would go. I'll second Bonnie's motion. Yes. I have to eat dinner. <laughs> I think yeah. it's better to wait. Sorry, but I think it's also better to wait till next week. We seem to be losing people and yeah. <laughs> uh, feel bad for the staff having to wait. And, um, I think moving is a good idea till next week. It won't take that long. With that, we get uh, motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Uh, second by Mary. All those in favor, signify by say, saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. All right. Have a great weekend, everybody. Okay. Cheryl, Bob, Mike. Thanks, everybody. Coming.